the mic up. Good afternoon, everybody. We'll call the meeting of the Liberal County Board of Commissioners to order. Mr. Stevens will be back in the room in just a second. <clears throat> Thank all of you who, uh, who could uh, make it today. We appreciate you know a lot of things going on <clears throat> in and around our community. So. Thank you for your sacrifice and uh, giving your time and talent for Liberty County. Mr. Brown, has the media been properly advertised? Yes, sir, it has. Thank you, sir. The evidence there. Hello, Robert. Good to see you. Um, let us all stand now. Mr. Joe Moses will lead us in our prayer and our pledge of allegiance. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this beautiful day and your bountiful blessings. We ask that you would be with this board of commissioners that it's, as they deliberate the business of community. We pray for it, wisdom and insight and foresight as they engage in these matters. And we thank you for this in the powerful and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus to Christ. Amen. 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 Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Mosley. And just for the matter of record, Mr. Brown, we just make note that we are honored to have <coughs> Liberty County Tax Commissioner with us today, Mr. Virgil Jones. Good to have you with us today. Thank you. What you do. Um, and while I'm thinking about our media people, let's give our media people a hand. Thank you for your. <laughs> You're behind the scenes, but you make it work for us. We appreciate that. Clinton and the team, thank you so much for that. Yeah, we appreciate you coming too. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> that part of media, we really do. Uh, all right, right on to our agenda finance reports, Ms. Kim McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, good evening. You should have your August financial report. I'll just uh, highlight some of the specifics about it. Uh, two months into the fiscal year, we've achieved about 7% of our revenues and spent about 16% of our budgeted expenditures. So of course, right now we are in the what we call the lean months. Mm -hmm. These are the months that we operate using a lot of fund balance because these are the, the months that we don't get the, the inflow of taxes like we do during December, January, February, and March. Um, at the end of August, our undesignated fund balance had approximately 4.5 months worth of operational expenditures. This same time last year, we were at 4.2 months, so we're better than we were a year ago and in a good position. To be in a, in a lean month, one of the lean months, what I call mm -hmm. August, September, October, November, those are the, the lean months leading up to when we set the millage. Um, your fund balance policy says to be within three to seven months worth of operational reserve, and you are right there. So um, as long as we're hitting our target, I think we're doing real well. A couple of departments have experienced, I'm sorry, have experienced um, some initial expenditures that kind of skewed their budget. So elections, they're running a little ahead of schedule because of the temporary employees and overtime and contract labor that were related to the runoff held in August. Um, data processing has several uh, annual maintenance contracts that they have to pay up front during the um, July and August time frame. So they're running slightly ahead of schedule. As usual, risk management is where we house all of our uh, general liability insurance that we pay annually. And that's typically paid the first or second month of the year, so that department will be skewed for the rest of the year. Um, the general admin fees, we actually went ahead and paid the entire year so that we could just get that out of the way. So there won't be any more expenses charged to that, to that department, but it looks like it's skewed. Um, Superior Court and Circuit-wide Public Defender, those are um, payments that are made a month in advance, so they look like they're running ahead of schedule, but they'll be fine. Roadways and walkways, if you'll remember, uh, we did a operating, or, um, sorry, a capital lease for the purchase of a, um, a Freightliner truck and an excavator. Um, so those were two very significant purchases, a little over $300,000. So that skewed that department's budget for a couple of months, but it, it'll gradually even out. 
And then um, other financing uses, this is the department where we charge the operating transfers out. And in August, the 911 department had to pay for their annual maintenance contract to Motorola, so that required a little bit more operating transfer than normal. Um, but we expect them to fall back in line as well. Solid waste at the end of August has a small uh, net income of about 128,000. Uh, they've achieved about 15, almost 16 percent of their revenues and spent about almost 12 percent of their expenditures. So they're running just fine. Um, each department operating within its budget parameter for this time of the year. And then your uh, special revenue funds, as I mentioned, 911 is running a little ahead of the schedule. That caused them to be skewed, and the operating transfer in the general fund shows a little skewed too. But they're, they'll fall back in line. And that maintenance, uh, maintenance contract was to Motorola for the radios and the phones. That's an annual contract. The good stuff, um, sales tax six. If you'll turn to the third page of sales tax six, this is the first time since May 2017 where we are in the black. What you say? We, we are in the black. So um, we are actually $29,000 ahead of schedule on that $54 million budget. So um, that's great news. Awesome. I think that's great news. So we are definitely on target to, to meet that $54 million, if not more, if we continue this way. Um, and had it not been for that huge uh, hit that we took during that very first month, mm -hmm. we would actually be a few hundred thousand dollars to the good. The good yeah. So, but but it's taken us three years to get there, but but we're there, and I think that's great news. And in the midst of a pandemic. And mm. in the midst of a pandemic, exactly. So, um, people are still ordering things, yes, you know, and going to drive-throughs and and going to Walmart and Lowe's apparently. <laughs> So um, that's all I have for your report. Uh, everything else is running as usual, and we're getting ready for the audit that will start next month. Um, we're going to be pretty tight during the month of October for that. That's all I have, unless somebody has something specific, a question for me. Any questions for Ms. McLaughlin? I think you made us happy. Uh, yeah, I, I love seeing those sales tax yeah. numbers come in. Yeah. That was that was great. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sure. Mr. Long. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Um, wanted to kind of go over a few things with you. Uh, we do have uh, the Elming monies are available to us. Um, I've got some requests from uh, Commissioner Thrift and uh, several other commissioners were putting those packages together. A um, couple left, if y'all have any ideas or anything you want me to do, uh, please let me know as soon as you can, because what I'd like to do, Chairman, is try to bring those results back to you at the regular meeting so that I can go ahead and request this, these funds from the Department of Transportation. Commissioner Thrift's um, request is to use some of the LMIG for a project. I ask me that again. Commissioner Thrift. <clears throat> she did. Yeah. Because I was hoping we could use some of that for the Yeomans Road project. Yes. Sir. We have to. Yes, sir. Because what, what I was going to do is kind of put together uh, a list of projects okay. that uh, have been submitted so that I could present it to you guys and then you guys divvy up. Pass it out. You would okay. Like to divvy it up. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I, and, um, so you just got this number, Trent, this 353? You just got that? How, how long have you, have you had that? It was, we, we had that on, uh, we got it in the beginning of July. Okay. So it's been on my, my, uh, <coughs> my monthly report for mm -hmm. two months. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, I, um, <laughs> when, 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 when do you need um, my You can, just, my, my you can just get with me the first part of next week. Okay. All right. so what mm -hmm. I need to do is I need a couple of days to uh, put things together so that I can have it. Because I have to be whatever the week before the first meeting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what does it take to? Uh, I Trent. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just um, right now just looking at it. If it's if it's three of us, then um, even split is mm -hmm. what a hundred thousand. Okay. Yes, sir. But, but um, I'll, I'll I'll get with you. Yes, sir. That way, what I can do is I can kind of put the list out there and then let you guys mm -hmm. separate it. All right. Okay. 
Mr. Chairman, that's what you were talking about, mm -hmm. utilizing some of the old big money on? On Yeomans. On Yeomans, yes. Because <clears throat> it's going to break the bank with me and you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to break the bank with me and you. Well. So we'll do some sharing. We'll do some sharing. That's the fairest way to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. You got any right of way acquisition to do down there? No. No, sir. No. Thanks. Yes, sir. I kept all the easements, all the drainage goes down the easements that we currently have. <laughs> He's and everything stays inside the right of way that we already have. And we don't have any utilities in that right of way, ours? We have uh, Coastal EMC move theirs out. Um, there's a few things, uh, water line wise, that we talked to. Uh, Consolidated utilities about theirs. Um, we have sent certified mail and uh, plans and hand delivered plans uh, to CenturyLink to uh, get any kind of um, response from them as far as what's going on. Um, no response from CenturyLink. The fire hydrants are there old? No, there's none down there. Not on Yeoman's Road. No. There, there's some in the in the neighborhood surrounding it. But there's not any on the dirt section. No. Mm -mm. What did we have? A wet pond down there at one time? We didn't have anything. Yes, there is a wet well, pond. Well, we had the Sunbury Fire Department, but we had a there, there is a wet pond. Where? Where you go down to the end of the uh, the retreat at Sunbury. You know, as it comes out, there's a little pond. We did have a wet. We used to have one there. A little wet hydrant that's in that little pond. There's yeah, you're right. Pond. Yeah. It's on the left hand side of Yeoman's Road. I apologize if I'm moving. No, I had surgery about two weeks ago, and mm -hmm. it hurts me to stand still. So I'm I'm moving so that I'm not. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. so I don't want you to think that I'm just nervous moving. <laughs> mm -mm. So. Not, we ain't paid attention to now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, East End Fire Station is looking good. Uh, they've been out back out there uh, regrading the site and. Uh, Doing a little bit of site work, so that's wrapping up and looking good. The building inside is looking good. I think Mr. Brown will tell you, I think they're going to be pretty close to being on time. Uh, Melvin Lane, uh, we have been monitoring that pretty closely. Um, with all the rain we've had lately, uh, we you know we, we mucked all the bad dirt out and we put a lot of hard man in, and then it got rutted up. And it, underneath the ruts, it's hard. So what we ended up doing was hauling in a few extra loads in the low spot and we super elevated the road so everybody has a side that they get in and out until we um, get a little bit of a break with the weather. Uh, the other thing we're going to do too, that it's not going to be like a fix for the water standing in there, that's just a construction thing. Um, we're going to go ahead and get some sock drain. We've got some savings and some erosion control items. And we're going to divert those funds into uh, doing some sock drain underneath the curb so that I keep that uh, base material dry so that we don't have a future but, problem. Yeah, it just, um, and I'm saying this on here, is this, um, since you and I talked on Monday, this, <laughs> this update here, this, yes, sir. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. Well, they were out there yesterday. Yesterday, yesterday. okay. Yeah. As long as Miss Julia May can get in and out of there, that's, that's all I need <laughs> uh, un until it's a finished product. Right. And you're saying she can. She can. Me and Eddie going down there in the morning. Can we get in and out of there? I certainly hope so. If it rains again tonight, we we'll have to be careful. Uh, it, it, won't, it, won't, it won't rain tonight. I can promise you we can get in and out. <laughs> I'm not talking about putting your truck in four-wheel drive. Now, Miss Julie <laughs> ain't got no four-wheel drive. She just got a regular old yeah, we, Ford. We, we've, had, uh, the, we've had our inspector out there every day Okay. Um, since it's been raining. And uh, I think there may be one day that the contractor was not there okay. to try to make sure that it was passed. Okay. he have been very responsive as far as keeping people going. Okay. Um, Yeoman's Road. Uh, we did a couple of uh, value engineering on what we have. Uh, the original estimate was about 989000 yeah. right at a million dollars. Uh, we did some uh, value engineering, changed a few pipe sizes and a few things. We got it down to about 945000 um, we also looked at uh, possibly just doing curb and gutter on the right-hand side of the road, which is the side that has the residence on it, right. um, and doing a roadside ditch on the left-hand side of the road, and that brings it down to about 900000 
So uh, the plans are ready to go with curb and gutter on both sides of the road. Um, but if we come up with money and we decide to go with uh, uh, roadside ditch on the left-hand side, we'll have to do a little bit of modification um, to the plans to get rid of that curb and gutter on that side, but it'll be ready to go pretty quickly once we made that decision. I just wasn't gonna go change the plans until we decided mm -hmm. that. Let me, get, let me get back with you and we'll, we'll make that. Yes, sir, perfect. Um, Third Street, contractor is supposed to have been back out there today. Um, I came over here before my inspector got back to the office, so I don't know if they were back there today or not. Um, they can physically finish before October 29th, but they've got to get on the project. Um, we've had a lot of complaints from citizens in the area, and uh, we've been uh, out there every day trying to address citizens' complaints and uh, to prompt the contractor along to do it. Never had this problem out of Sykes Brothers before. They've always been a, a good contractor for us. So I'm not sure kind of what's going on right now, if they just got a little too much to do or what, but, or if they felt like they left too much on the table and they're just trying to do it in between jobs. I don't know. But um, we are working diligently to make sure that that project is moving um, and that everybody can get their mail and everybody can get in and out of their house and in and out of their driveways. Um, we're working on a utility ordinance. Um, kind of some of these things with like CenturyLink not being able to get our utilities moved and all, we, we need to address some of those things in the long run, uh, where utilities are supposed to be and how uh, they get their permission to be in the rights of way. So what we're trying to do is put together a utility ordinance. Uh, we're gonna go through it um, staff level first and then we'll bring it up to you guys. How have we gone this long without having one? Just well, you know, we have just a little policy that says if you're going to put something in the right of way, you got to come to the commissioner. Mm -hmm. And so for the most part, if somebody's putting in a water line or something like that, they come and we do bring it to you. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we had like Hargrave put their big lines in, we did bring that to you. So we, we do bring those to you along mm -hmm. and along. Mm -hmm. But, you know, over the years, folks like Coast Utilities, they've got cable everywhere mm. and you know uh georgia power has cable everywhere and you know we don't have any trouble with georgia power it's just with the telephone industry the way that it's going and how the ownership of uh, uh centurylink is it's difficult for us mm. to, to keep going in the old status quo hope that makes sense we're trying to so if we, let's say we um create this ordinance and we adopt it the um the stuff that's in place right now would be grandfathered in i, I mean it wouldn't this ordinance wouldn't apply to no, this thing like, gonna... like like how melvin lane is right now mm -hmm. it wouldn't do nothing you'll still have the same fight that you got now yes and all we're, we're still but, gonna but you but you would think that all new stuff would be done a certain way now i mean if someone was cutting a, a road through here through the woods there is no telephone stuff there, but we we talking about an existing road that's got lines that we beg in Central Link to move. This ordinance wouldn't really have anything to do to make that better. We just got to deal with it the way we're dealing with it now. Going forward, yes. new stuff will be governed by the ordinance. That's right. Okay. That's right. I'm, I'm thinking that, that one thing we would address with legal counsel in a situation like this is a a, a provider, service provider, just can't keep po causing a public project to be postponed. Mm -hmm. And so what I'd look for in an ordinance is a way to affect those things that are in place, to set up, to set up, the, they have a lot of rights under state acquisition and stuff like that, but is to set up a legal process where we give official notification pursuant to an ordinance that would require, if they're gonna be here in Liberty County, to respond to certain things within time limits or do whatever. So I, that's the other part of the legal side of me that wants to go in there and put something in an ordinance that would affect what we're happening right now. Something from 20. We still have to deal with it, but they'll have a time that they got to respond. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a basis to hold them on or go to court to, okay. to make them get moved. On, okay. on that same note there, Joy, but the utilities that are out there, if they're within our right of way, they'll, we ought to be able to get uh, the franchise fee for that, haven't we? I mean, these, these 
utilities are regulated by the Public Service Commission would pay a franchise fee back to the county if they're within our right of way. I don't think unless you have a separate ordinance except for uh, uh, financial institutions. We have an ordinance that governs financial institution franchise fees, but you'd have to have a separate ordinance that you would adopt to require those fees to be paid. I thought that would be at the state level. No, sir. We, we, we'd, have to, we'd have to enact an ordinance here to require those fees if they were in the public right away. And that, may, that very well may be something we want to address as part of this also. Right. Okay. I think on any new construction, we're we're behind the curb and gutter uh, or wherever. But some of these roads were lanes, uh, just like the one Commissioner Gillis is talking about, Melvin Lane. Yes, you know, the phone company. They might they might have been one person that lived back there, and they just went wherever they wanted to go to put it in. But you know, if you inherited it, it and Madison River and then CenturyLink inherited it. You know, it should not be our responsibility to have to move that stuff out of the way. I mean, you know, regardless, if, if it's a driveway or if it's our road, they ought to be able to, to bear the cost on it. Yes, yeah, sure. sir. And, and there is, there is a, that. yes, sir, you're right. And we do abide by the, the common practice of prior rights. You know, who was there first pays. So like from Melvin Lane, they were there first we took them into our right of way. That's why we could say, yes, we can justifiably pay to locate their line. There are several locations where we have existing roadways and existing right of ways that we're trying to improve the road, like Yeoman's Road. Anybody that's in that right of way, we're going to have been there first before them, so they will have to pay to move their utilities. Well, that's about, about what we were talking about with the, with, I mean, somewhere down the line, There'll be, it, it may not be this board, but someone will, will put in fire hydrants. And I want to make sure that somewhere that there's going to be a, enough right away there to put uh, the six inch water line for hydrants. So, yes, sir. This, um, I agree with you wholeheartedly. But I don't agree with that thing down there. I'll tell you right now, it's not my district. I've worked with Mr. Gillard on it, the Century Link to build us to move their stuff out of the way that they went out and located on 30 feet on the other side of the road and then you stop a contractor for several months months and now we're in a wet season and mm -hmm. it's a oh i agree we don't have to drive down it but those folks that's they driving do. down it don't appreciate it mm -hmm. no i agree okay impaired waters um we do have an impaired waters plan and we do a little bit of monitoring along the peak <laughs> Um, basically what we do is we just go take the samples and we ship them off and we have to get them sampled and we do the reporting for that. Um, so far, that's going pretty well. Uh, transfer station tipping four, we're going to get to that in just a minute. Um, we did do a little bit of uh, conceptual drawings for DOT on uh, EG Miles Parkway for center turn lane. Um, we had a, a meeting with DOT several weeks ago. Wait, wait, what about on EG Miles? Uh, yeah, the, the section is only four lane with no center turn lane. On Arlington yeah. Park up in that area? Oh, yes, sir. From uh, the railroad tracks to basically uh, uh, the hospital up in there. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, and they were very conceptual. Um, lots 20, 21 and 22 limit. I, I mean, I, just to talk about that, I mean, you just, it's four lanes now, and you want to put a center lane so you don't really have to do a drawing for that, do you? Just put it in the center, don't you? Well, you don't really, what you got to do is you got to move. I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that was the case. Yeah. That'd be easy to just restripe it, kind of like what we did downtown Riceboro. Well, you're going to have to tell They had all the asphalt in Riceboro. We need said, to hey, make it wider. Sure. It's got to be wider. Are we doing that with conjunction with the city? Is that the reason we're doing that? DOT. T Splash yes, Project. With the, uh, mm -hmm. the T Splash Fund. T Splash Project. Mm -hmm. Looking at that's kind of one of our regional things we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Okay, flood risk maps. Um, there's another uh, flood map revision coming uh, probably in 2022. Uh, and it'll be along the Peacock Canal, basically from the CSX Railroad back up. Alligator Creek to 84 and Peacock Canal to 84. 
they found some things in the last uh, maps that they didn't like, so they're going back in and redoing some of those. So uh, during that time period, there have been several uh, flood map revisions and that we've worked on, so we sent them a bunch of information and had some good conversations with them. And uh, some of the road deed stuff, we were able to move it over into digital format so that we could try to attach that to some of our uh, road GIS stuff. Other than that, that's it for my report. You want to have any questions on that? Not a, not a question, but I guess I need to get to <clears throat> make sure that the commission's all on one accord here. When it comes back to the LMB, the 353, 676, we have three projects. Commissioner Giller has one, Commissioner Stevens, and Commissioner Thrift has active projects. Right. We're simply going to divide those funds by, those, by three. And make sure everybody's clear. Yeah. All right, okay, thank you. And remember on that, we have a 30% match on our side. Okay. That's on top of this. All right, sir. Trent, question on that, and I, I think Commissioner Stevens actually brought this up at the last meeting, but since we passed the T-splosh yeah. and it'll go into effect, that should drop to 10. 10. And so yeah. can, can you I'll ask about that. Yeah, if you don't yeah. mind, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. A little more bang for our buck. Yeah, mm -hmm. that'd be awesome. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Down at the corner of Bill Carter and 84, I think it's on the county property, right at the edge of it, we've got a dead uh, pine tree that's it's dead. The limbs keep falling off. Some of it has fallen on the 84, some of it has fallen on to the, if you're mm -hmm. making the right turn, going to um, Midway. Mm -hmm. probably, we will need to remove that tree. Mm -hmm. I noticed that debris on the road when I came through there yesterday. I said, right, that's, that's what it looks it's a little trashy down out. there. I didn't, I didn't realize it was a tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I saw a lot of um, pine and cones and stuff on the street. Right. Okay. Hey, sir. I'm sorry. I was trying to write down. <laughs> Get too many things I won't remember. It's all right. Okay. Um, we took bids uh, on the transfer station tip. Um, as you wear, that's a hardened concrete floor because we dump the trash on the floor and we push it over into the tops of the trucks and it just wears out over time just because of the nature of the activity. Um, we put it out with uh, two different options. Um, one of them is the most similar to what we have now. Um, it's got an iron aggregate in it so it gets a really high compressive concrete. Um, we found another one that was very, very close. It doesn't quite have the uh, aggregate strength, but it kept us from sole sourcing um, so that we could kind of make sure we had good competitive prices. Um, we took two bids. Um, the bid from Osborne Services is $230,322. Um, that was for the concrete with the iron in it, option one. Then we had, an, uh, and they did submit um, their MWBE uh, requirements on that. The other contractor was um, Cornerstone Construction Services um, with the option number two, which is the lesser material. Uh, they were $224,546. However, they did not submit any MWBE requirements. And uh, Delisa um, sent us a letter saying that they were uh, considered a non-responsive bid. What we would like to do t uh, today is recommend to you that we go with the bid for um, option one, which is the Echo Floor 404 with Osborne contra uh, Contract Services uh, in the amount of $230,322. Uh, they are responsive and they do have the MWBE requirements and it is the same floor as what we have now. Um, and I'm, you know, this one has lasted much longer than the anticipated life. So um, I think to stick with what we have now, they met the MWBE goals is worth the extra $5,500. That was advertised local right? Everybody yes, sir. It was advertised local on our website. We put it on state procurement website and we called these people. In the, in the newspaper. And in the newspaper, yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Because yeah, a lot of these folks, they're, one of them's in Tampa, um, another one's in South Carolina, so they're not going to see it locally. 
So uh, we, we tried to make sure we had a good representation. Yeah. I'm asking. Yeah. When you recommend oh. that uh, recommending uh, mm -hmm. Osborne, Osborne contract yeah. services for two hundred thirty thousand three hundred thirty-two dollars even. And that's for the repair of that floor. Yes, sir. That will that will repair the floor. And basically, they do it in a weekend. Jim. Yes, sir. Ready for a motion. Ready for a motion. Jim, I make a motion that we accept the bid from Osborne Contract Service for two hundred thirty thousand three hundred thirty-two dollars to repair the floor at the uh, transfer station. Second. Yeah. Motion and a second. We approve the bid from uh, Osborne Contract Services, 233.22. Any further discussion? Briefly, Trent, what scale, the scales are going to be shut down for a week? No, sir. We'll do it over a weekend. Weekend? Okay. When they're not there. Okay. Yeah, we try not to shut the scales down. Right. Does that affect all the municipalities and a whole bunch of folks. That's good. Even if we have to do it side at a time, because just so, it, so everybody knows what they do, they'll come in and they'll shot blast all the concrete out, put in a new rebar, and put new concrete. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. All in favor, raise your right hand, please. All right. Accept the bid. Thank you very much. That's all I have tonight. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Recreation, Mr. Jimmy Martin. Right. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, sir. I have two issues to bring before you tonight. Mm -hmm. um, the first is a proposal that was brought to the Recreation Board by Recreation Board member Kenneth Howard to consider naming the basketball courts at Liberty Independent Troop Park, uh, basically dedicating them, naming them for a young man who was tragically killed was when he was a, a, a student at Liberty County High School, very popular student, I might add. A uh, young man was also a participant in the Liberty County Recreation Department as he was growing up. Uh, his name is Albert Dock, nicknamed Spud. And um, that proposal came from Mr. Howard. Uh, it was presented to the Recreation Board. It was discussed and ultimately unanimously voted in favor of doing that. So I did want to bring that to you guys for, for your approval. Um, you're familiar with the courts I'm referring to, Liberty Independent Troop Park, right beside Stafford Pavilion, right beside Highway 84 here in Hinesville. Very popular uh, facility, <laughs> to highly say used, least. sometimes too highly. <laughs> um, so uh, that is mm -hmm. a, a very visible facility too. You know, were it to be named in, so to be named for someone, that's a very good place to be named. Okay. Uh, and just the basketball court. That's two courts area. Two courts. Oh, that's right. There are two courts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would add that the recreation board's, you know, vision of that was, you know, there simply be a sign posted there mm -hmm. in his honor. Um, of course, the dedication ceremony, you know, to come at some point uh, whenever that was appropriate in light mm -hmm. of all the public health emergency we're, we're dealing with now. Yeah. Um, but um, that's the essence of that. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Jimmy. We, we dedicated, what did we dedicate something at the park for a, someone? Playground. Uh, we did the playground for Mike playground. Carriker, playground. who was a recreation playground. board member who passed away. Playground, yeah. Several years ago. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. I know. Sure. Um, yes. Yeah, no, 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 Jimmy, that's so the, the official name would be, it wouldn't be um, Albert Spud Dark Court, it would be Courts with the S on it. Would that be? Yes, sir. I would, I would think so. Think so because of the two, Correct. the two full courts. Okay. That, that would be my opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I know Commissioner Frazier, you had a part in this. You want to, you want to make some comments? I'm not forcing you. Oh. Yeah. Of course, you know, you, you never have to force me to say a word. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, first of all, I just want to say uh, thanks to the Recreation Board, uh, to Mr. Martin uh, and Mr. Howard as well for, uh, for, for moving a step forward, uh, uh, Spud was was well loved throughout the community. Uh, uh, of course, you know with his family, uh, with the roots here, and and it's always saddening, you know, with with, uh, with a tragedy like that, you know, especially with how he lost his life. But uh, one thing I can say about Liberty County is that. 
that whenever we see tragedy, normally we come together. I've seen that since you know I was a, a kid here, growing up and with Desert Storm and everything else. So uh, it, it's just, I mean, I, I am kind of speechless about this because I knew this young man. Uh, I, I know his 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 entire family. Uh, so I, I just wanted to say thank you to the, to the right board for for I guess accepting my request to uh, to name those course after this young man who, you know, his future was so bright. Uh, so us shining that light on those courts and uh, remembering him in that type of way means a lot to me. So I, I want to say thank you uh, to everyone who had a part in it. And, and I know I, I could speak for the family. They're, they're happy as well. So I just want to say thank you for, for the support with that one. You need a motion, Mr. Chairman? Yes, I need a motion. Uh, make that motion that we approve naming for um, Albert Spud Dock. Is there a second? It's my honor to, to, to second that motion, Mr. Chairman. second we, we named the courts at Liberty Independent Truth Park, the Albert Spud Dock Courts. Any further discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. Those opposed? All right. Let us know when and where, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Again, I would think that we would, you know, maybe wait a while for, you know, well, certainly. To hopefully no get back to normal. Do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Will we try to have some sort of ceremony. Yeah. And let's yeah. See, just make sure I got it right. He, he, would he have been a senior? He would have graduated. But would he have played when they won the state? Would he have been like a freshman when they won the state championship? Would he have been? He wasn't far behind those guys. Mm -mm. No. I'm yeah, not he, sure. He about just that. missed that cut. Yeah. yeah I don't think he missed it by much. He, uh -uh. Probably, he probably was in the eighth or ninth grade. Right. He didn't miss it by much. Okay. He would have been a friend. I know he was friends with Richard LeCount and all those guys. Okay. I'll just ask you. Facility usage. Yes, sir. Okay. This is our, the second thing I'd like to bring before you guys today. Um, of course, you know that all of our facilities were shut down due to some issues we were having with um, uh, over usage and uh, perhaps being used in a manner that was not consistent with the guidelines that have been set forth by the CDC and other, other agencies regarding the COVID-19 situation. Um, I did want to propose to you guys, this board, that um, we consider allowing some limited use of some outdoor facilities. Uh, there are some groups out there that uh, even before this issue came up causing us to close the facilities, have been doing a pretty good job of following the guidelines and you know they've been somewhat penalized maybe a little unfairly perhaps a little unfairly because you know they were doing what they should have done they were penalized because there were others who were not doing what they were doing so essentially what i have here in this proposal is 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 a means of allowing use of those facilities on a limited basis uh, under the supervision of our staff and the procedure would call for groups that wanted to use facilities to be approved in advance. Uh, that would allow them, and a part of that approval would be that they would agree to follow the guidelines that are set forth in this proposal uh, in terms of how many people could be on the facility at one time, uh, some of the practices they would use, the actual things they would do on the field. Uh, for example, games would not be allowed. It would only be use of practices and only certain things would be allowed during those practices. For example, conditioning drills or, or practicing certain aspects of the game, um, but not, you know, full full contact. For example, in football, uh, or blocking drills in football, where you're put, you know, face to face with someone. Uh, just to use those as examples, uh, those type of things would not be allowed. And all that is spelled out in the proposal. I won't I won't read through every bit of it, but um, you know, the requirement would be they'd be approved agree to follow guidelines, they'd be approved for use, they would then be allowed to reserve facilities at a certain date and time. Um, our staff would open the facility for them, monitor their usage of the facility, and then close it when they were finished. And if there was a problem with them following the guidelines, then we would have the means to deny them use of those facilities uh, from that point forward. Is this, uh, this is the recommendation of your board to follow these guidelines? Yes, sir. Your board's on Yes, sir. It. Just just for okay. facility usage right. during this right. shutdown. I'm sure y'all have already looked at all the safety issues and all that. Actually, most of these guidelines come from the stuff, the, the guidelines set forth from national, from governing organizations 
like U.S. soccer or mm -hmm. Little League baseball or Pop Warner football. Uh, you know, we used those, we pulled bits and pieces from those that pertain to our program and, and tried to follow those same, same guidelines. Right. Okay. We also went a little forward with that, Mr. Commissioner, Mr. Chairman, and you know we kind of spelled out for the different facilities available to include baseball and softball fields, the football fields, soccer fields, batting cages, and the tennis courts. Uh, those were the facilities we felt like we could adequately monitor. monitor. Uh, others, like for example, playgrounds, basketball courts, we didn't feel like we could adequately monitor those facilities, mm -hmm. and those are some of the areas where problems came up before. Um, so we did not include them as a part of this proposal. But uh, we went, you know, we spelled out how that usage you have to, would have to take place for baseball and softball fields, football field, and each of those facilities that would be available for use. So we need a recommendation yeah. or? We need a motion. Or so I, I, um, I just have one question. No, so now, but the, the league play is still suspended, right? Yes, sir. No, because we're not I'm, doing I'm any saying, organized activities. I'm just looking at uh, the number one on um, on baseball and softball, say um, not to exceed 15. Yes, sir. Typically, that is a, about the number of kids and coaches you have with one team. Okay. So they would be, you know, a, a team could conceivably use the facility. That would be what we would consider a group usage. Um, they would use the facility for a team practice. But you but couldn't have a game because you need. You could not have a game. You would need at least 18, I guess, for uh, baseball. You'd have to have, well, yeah, nine versus nine would be 18, and then yeah. you'd have coaches too. So, uh, and, and it goes on to say that. You know, Jimmy, when I, when, I said, when, I, when I said 18, I had already calculated that. <laughs> <laughs> I should have known that. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, so 15, that, let's say if it was a team that just wanted to go out and, and practice. Um, but they couldn't play against an, another team because you couldn't allow more than 15. That's great. Okay. They, we would allow, for, with using that example, baseball or softball, a simulated game between the players on that one team. For example, right. you know, your players in the field, right. Right. batter hitting the ball, right. yeah. running the bases, yeah. okay. that sort of yes. thing, because we feel like you could socially distance in, mm -hmm. in that activity. Very good. Same with football and soccer. Except football and soccer, we. It, we included in there, along the guidelines for those governing bodies that, that govern those activities, not to do game simulation because you can't do that and maintain social distance. Right, yeah, because I, I was just thinking football, you could play kind of like seven on seven, but, but that's simulating game activity. Yeah. You, okay. you, couldn't, you couldn't really practice the social distancing. And all of this was done in a manner so that we could, you know, allow them some usage of the fields, which is mm -hmm. what they're asking for. Um, I don't think we should be in a position of allowing them to do whatever they want because that's where the problems came mm -hmm. up before. Right, right. So even this will be, be some strict this will be by, by contract. I'm sorry, sir. This will be by contract. They have to sign paperwork. They would sign a, a list of rules similar to this and okay. agreement with, with, uh, with that's part of the approval process for them is to agree to these rules. Okay. And um, again, they still would be required to reserve that facility for usage. It's not just show up and use okay. it. They have to okay. reserve it. Okay. Our staff would have to be there and monitor that usage. Okay. All right. I want to make sure that that word monitors in there and not police it. I want to make sure that that, that, <laughs> I mean, that was discussed. That, you know, we don't want to get in a contest with somebody up there who's mad. Uh, we monitor it to the situation, Jimmy, and then let the authorities handle it. I agree, Commissioner Walden, and, and you know my 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 view of that is you know we we would advise them if they were not following the guidelines, and then the next time they were to request a reservation, we could address that at that point. And say, you can't continue. Did you find that young man that, that jumped over that fence with that skateboard other day? Did you? I, I advised him of what constituted criminal trespass on that particular situation. <laughs> but okay. but look, no. just wanted to skate. Though. Well, from what Commissioner Walden said, though, they need to know, though, that our our representative, when they speak, they need to listen. So they just can't ignore them because they don't have a, a, a badge on their chest. That's right. Yeah. And I think I think that we will address that strongly in the approval process. Mm -hmm. And I know that the groups that 
I, that I expect to, to want to take advantage of this this uh, opportunity are well aware of the authority that that our, our staff carries in that regard. All right, Chair, I a motion. Uh, I make a recommendation, Mr. Chair, for the um, approval on the approval of the Board of Rec uh, Recreation to approve the facility usage. Okay, is that second? second. Motion and second. We approve the presented facility usage policy uh, with the concerns we all express. Um, we appreciate the Rec Board for <laughs> trying to work with our local population to give them some access to recreation and uh, just getting out there doing something. So appreciate that. Thank Any you further guys. discussion? Yeah, one thing, um, mm -hmm. you know, there are going to be people that are going to want to do this a little bit later in the nighttime, and I know that because of the staggered times, we're, we're probably going to be seeing possibly the, the lights stay on a little bit. So everybody <coughs> get alarmed if we get phone calls that somebody forgot to turn the lights on. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that would be our guys that would have well, to get to them out, so they, that shouldn't happen. Possibilities. So. It's it's always possible, but actually, the times that we're setting forth for use of facilities would would probably allow us not to have to use the lights. Well, I mean, the time will change here. What thirty days? That's true. Mm -hmm. so, and just adjust your time. Yes. Yeah. Good, very well, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. All, right. Thank okay. you. All in favor. All right. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I've, I've, uh, um, I vote against it, uh, and, and I fully understand, Mr. Martin, um, you and your staff, and you know we're trying to do what we can to go back to a sense of normalcy. But um, I, I just still think that with the fall of the year, and um, I just I just see it as just to be a little a little risky. So um, I, I vote against it. Okay. All right. So duly noted. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Evening, everybody. Good evening, sir. I've distributed for informational purposes uh, a disorderly conduct ordinance, and it addresses two concerns. The first is the, the, uh, the issue of misdemeanor marijuana possession. And as many of you know, most, many if not most jurisdictions are reconsidering the proper handling of misdemeanor marijuana. Uh, possession cases and for a variety of public policy uh, reasons. Some jurisdictions are simply decriminalizing it. Others, like the city of Hinesville, is simply restricting uh, prosecution to citation only um, procedures uh, and imposing a modest monetary fine or community service if, that, if that's not appropriate. And so in order to be consistent with the city of Hinesville and address some of those same public policy concerns, this ordinance mirrors the city of Hinesville's in that regard in that anyone uh, charged with misdemeanor uh, marijuana possession under this ordinance uh, will be cited only and subject to a fine not to exceed $75. Uh, importantly, you know, I think as a practical matter, our state court is already um, disposing of misdemeanor marijuana cases with alternative um, um, uh, remedies. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you know, as a practical matter, it may not be needed, but I think it's important because it gives our law enforcement and the courts a formal mechanism to, uh, you know, to more appropriately handle and dispose of these misdemeanor marijuana cases. Uh, currently, that's not available. Uh, and also, you know, this does not replace state law. Currently, state law does uh, prohibit misdemeanor marijuana possession. Uh, and so a person can still be charged with state offenses as well. But again, this gives law enforcement an additional tool and the discretion to charge them under our ordinance so that they'll be subject only to citation, prosecution, and a monetary fine. And I think that's consistent with both the city of Hinesville and more in line with the state court practices currently. Uh, the second concern it addresses are just uh, disorderly conduct ordinances generally. Most counties address these misdemeanor marijuana possession issues through disorderly conduct ordinances, but uh, we did not have one. We have reference to disorderly conduct, but we don't have a formal disorderly um, conduct ordinance. So this also uh, provides for a traditional disorderly conduct ordinance, uh, and it's similar to most jurisdictions throughout the state. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it prohibits uh, 
incidents of uh, threats and physical violence against person and property, just traditional notions of disorderly conduct. So that's what this ordinance is uh, intended to accomplish, address those two concerns, give the county a traditional disorderly conduct ordinance, and uh, provide for a, perhaps a more appropriate handling of misdemeanor marijuana cases. <laughs> I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. That's and forgive me if I can't hear if it sounds so unusual you, tonight, I'm still getting over this sinus infection. The disorderly conduct ordinance, did the city of Hinesville practice that? I'm sorry, sir? The disorderly conduct uh, The ordinance. city of Hinesville, I do, I do believe they have some, but most uh, municipalities, unlike counties, uh, they are not addressing it for whatever reason under disorderly conduct ordinances. They're mm -hmm. simply fashioning a, a separate ordinance, separate ordinance and addressing it in that, in that fashion. Okay. And I won't get into the specifics of state law, but generally local governments can't uh, create uh, punishment or uh, provide for uh, remedies for offenses which are already governed by state law. But Georgia law gives counties and cities specific authority to adopt their own disorderly conduct ordinances. And so that's why we're taking this approach and rather than having a, a standalone ordinance which addresses misdemeanor where you know, I like the possession idea of only. Being as uniform as possible. Yes. I do. That was the intent. The, the effect of the ordinance is the same as the city of Hinesville's and many other jurisdictions that have, that have considered. And especially if you say the state courts are already practicing. Yes, it's consistent. I, I can't say that they'll impose a $75 fine, but mm -hmm. they work with the, uh, with the defendant and uh, you know, they pursue alternative uh, disposition rather than definitely not imprisonment mm -hmm. uh, or, or severe monetary fines, but yeah. they try to work with the defendant to resolve it through alternative means, whether it be community service or some other modest punishment. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Chairman. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Mr. Davis, now, um, in misdemeanor that, um, I mean, it'd be a fine, he won't go to jail or nothing like that. But, uh, I mean, can the, the individual be like a repeat offender? I mean, he, he could do this two or three times a day if he wanted to? Well, I don't think so. And I, I think, that's that's why I, I made clear this only is a, this is an additional tool and it gives discretion to law enforcement in the courts. There is still a state law which prohibits and outlaws misdemeanor marijuana possession. So the officer is free to charge him under state law with that crime if he wants. If he's, as you mentioned, a repeat offender and just someone who's um, not amenable to to you know, rehabilitation or changing his ways. So it doesn't prohibit the officer from doing that, the courts from charging with those offenses, mm -hmm. but it just gives the officer of the courts an additional avenue to, per, to pursue uh, those sorts of cases. I mean, it's, I mean, it's a misdemeanor, but he can, if he did it so many times, he could get stronger punishment? Mm -hmm. He could. I mean, uh, Georgia I'm law strong, provides strong, for Stronger, it. like, I mean, it wouldn't escalate to a felony, would it? No. Uh, you know, Georgia law provides for so pretty steep monetary fines and imprisonment, even for misdemeanor violations of misdemeanor oh, okay. law. Okay. Um, I, I, I forgive me, I don't know what that is off the top of my head, but I think it's in you know, jail not to exceed six months. I can confirm that. Okay. So if you have a person who is a repeat offender, the officer does have the discretion to charge him under state law, and, and the courts can prosecute him under state law as well. This only refers to a violation of county ordinance. And again, it's just another tool to allow the officers in the courts to pursue that sort of alternative disposition without having to charge someone with a violation of a state law and have that appear on their record, uh, especially young offenders. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think, I'm not too sure, I think Chatham County has it set up a little differently. First time it's a fine, uh, second time it's a fine, and the third time it changes, but it's still at the discretion of the officer. But if you're a repeated offender, mm -hmm. then it changes. It may not be just a misdemeanor. Yes, sir. some jurisdictions do take that approach. There is a graduated fine system. Mm -hmm. so for example, the first fine, the first offense might be fifty dollars. The second might be a hundred. Uh, third, two hundred. The fourth, and subsequent violations, five hundred. Some mm -hmm. jurisdictions do that. But I thought, given the city of Hinesville has already uh, enacted an ordinance that addresses this offense. It's probably more appropriate to have a consistent approach yeah. countywide. Uh, and again, this does not replace state law. So if you have a, a repeat offender who's just, uh, you know, uh, for whatever reason, resistant to complying with the law, uh, they can still charge him for a state law offense. Uh, this 
coordinates that we're looking at here, what is what is in place right now under State ordinance text, section one? Nothing. It's empty. As I mentioned, we we don't have a disorderly conduct ordinance. Yeah. Yes, sir. And um, but it's all a state law anyhow, right? The misdemeanor marijuana uh, is, and there is also a state law governing disorderly conduct. It's not quite as uh, specific as the one we have. The one we have, most counties adopt or something very similar to it. You, know, you can't uh, disturb uh, church services. You can't physically intimidate or incite violence. You can't threaten uh, or take uh, affirmative action to damage property. Uh, it's, the list is there, but it's all common sense, really. Um, and most, most counties do have that, that same or similar uh, disorderly conduct ordinance in place. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm just like, you know, when did this just all of a sudden come out of the blue that we do this? I mean, the, the, just, is this something that the state said? Or, I mean, we haven't had a judge come up here and mention that this is something we ought to look at? Well, I, I know for, I guess going back some years, probably at least four or so years, there have been discussions with local government officials, the courts and the sheriff about, you know, is there a way to appropriately handle these misdemeanor marijuana cases? And I think in the absence of a local ordinance like the Hinesville has or the, the county's proposing, the courts have just assumed that responsibility and their practice now is to provide for alternative disposition. But I think the courts and everybody probably feel better if there's a formal mechanism to do what they're doing now, kind of to ratify, in essence, to ratify that, pra that practice. And specifically, it's presented today because of conversations with, uh, with Mr. Frazier uh, regarding the specific issue of mis uh, marijuana, misdemeanor marijuana possession. And I think it's, it's not uncommon. You know, many jurisdictions have uh, addressed this well before now, but many are still reconsidering it. Uh, I think Hinesville's was fairly recent. Maybe, I know within the last year. But last several I think last year. Well, I mean, you know, they have they're, they're a little different than we are in government because they don't have an elected police chief. They have a appointed police chief, and the county we elect one. But I'm just saying, I've never had the sheriff ever say anything about it. An attorney, in fact, I don't know that I've ever had any public official, period, or a citizen say, "Hey, y'all need to change this." Um, this marijuana ordinance. That's what I was asking. Um, I mean, it says in here that, you know, to direct fighting words, if you take somebody's uh, less than an ounce of marijuana, then that's, they'll be fighting words. <laughs> I mean, you can get marijuana, I guess, by the ounce. I don't know. But you can also get beer by the can or a six pack. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to smoke less than an ounce, eventually you're going to go to something. A little different, but I mean, I don't, I'm not crazy about this at all. I mean, there's some of it in here, but I don't want to think I. That's, and yes, it's, it's for informational purposes. The public policy arguments, you know, perhaps um, Mr. Fraser can discuss with everyone tonight or at a later date. But, um, but, but again, I think state court. I think as a practical, I have to confirm with the court. But as a practical matter, I think their procedure oftentimes is simply to accept uh, a lesser plea or to d dismiss it outright upon payment of court cost. Uh, and I think one of the large concerns is uh, having this stigmatize young offenders and have this appear on their records. You know, of course, you also have concerns about overcrowding in jails, but I think younger offenders are the, are the main concern. And so this gives the court a formal mechanism where, I mean, oftentimes uh, ordinance violations and citations don't even appear on your record, but if they do, it's not something that would prejudice them for future employment or things of that kind. So I think that's the principal reason it's being pursued. An opinion on it, but if I thought I could get away with this little bit, I said that's what I'd get away with. But I mean, if I thought I was going to get in trouble with this little amount, I'd probably try to stay away from it completely. So I no, I, I mean, this is there are arguments against it as well. Not yes, sir. Not, not tonight. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's got to be published mm -hmm. anyhow, don't we? Wouldn't an ordinance like this have to go in the newspaper and people? It would have to be in the newspaper, but that's why I'm giving it for informational purposes uh, only tonight. 
and you folks can decide to formally consider it at the next meeting or another meeting if you'd like. Okay. Well, I've had plenty of calls and emails this week, and it ain't been about marijuana. Right. That's, a, that's my feeling. But to my knowledge, there's no pressing issue or incident that prompted this. It's just recent discussions with. Yes, sir. I mean that, that's that's fine, but uh, let, let me let me just say this: uh, with with this particular uh, policy that uh, I'm requesting being implemented in, in in Liberty County, this is nothing new. Uh, it just might be new to us in in our particular uh, area, but uh, I mean, uh, Statesboro, Bullock County, uh, Savannah has already passed it. There's there's many uh, jurisdictions in particularly just in the state of Georgia who already passed it. And uh, let me say this for the record as well. Uh, this policy isn't to, to condone anyone from smoking or, or, or even have anything to do with drugs. But uh, this is more of a, of a procedure or a policy put in place and implemented for, uh, for in my opinion, uh, when are we looking at uh, criminal justice reform? Uh, anything that we could do on a local level uh, to keep our young people. Now, trust me, I know some people need to be locked up, but I would hate for someone to uh, not be able to be a productive citizen in Liberty County or anywhere else for a joint or anything like that, where it could really uh, unravel their future employment unravel their future opportunity to go into the military or anything like that off of, of and I'm not perfect, I can tell you that. So I've made plenty of mistakes in my, my young life and I would hate for me not to be able to sit right here and be a county commissioner because of some of the mistakes that I've made. So in closing, uh, anything that we could do to, to provide some type of help and, and, and just like uh, that was stated, even if it does go through the court system, even if it's an alternative, you know, but not going on a record, that's, that's my biggest uh, issue. You know, uh, someone not be able to, you know, uh, they go through the whole entire interview process, but then they pull their criminal record and then they have this on there. And then now, you know, they can't provide for themselves or, or their family in the future. So that was, that was my stance on it. And I know you might have received a lot of phone calls, but I, I have on this issue for a couple of years. So. But it's a misdemeanor. I mean, I can't see misdemeanor keeping you out of armed services or, I mean, it's a misdemeanor. I don't think they, I didn't know it was that big an issue on just minor infractions on marijuana. I didn't think they took you to sell what well, well, and forget about you. Well, actually, uh, a marijuana infraction, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but even uh, whenever you're dealing with financial aid, that, that could be an issue as well. For, for financial aid, for college? I still didn't understand what you're saying. For, for uh, grants and financial aid in yeah. college, Right. You applying? Right for. A, I don't know if it's automatic disqualifier, but but it could it could get, give them a. a joint, smoking marijuana. It's gonna keep you from getting a grant. Don't smoke it. <laughs> I mean, it's just that simple. <laughs> don't smoke it if it's gonna jeopardize your livelihood. Don't drink it. Your you wife, guys, don't need it. Don't smoke it. That hey, it was what it, we, this isn't an action. I don't think, Mr. Frazier, and we can discuss. Oh this. yeah, we definitely can. But, um, we will. Hey, we will. Yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, they don't keep you from getting a job as a policeman. Yeah. They don't keep you from getting a job. I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, I, yeah. I, you, there's some you got things misdemeanor I'm really about to for a grant. Or what kind of you, grant you're applying for? But. I mean, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 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 Kelly, I just have yes, one question. Now, this uh, on the agenda it says um, this all the conduct slash misdemeanor marijuana is is that all the same? It is. As I mentioned, most counties address the misdemeanor uh, marijuana issue Through in the, the context of disorderly conduct. So, rather than appearing on a record, if it if it does formally noted in your record, as a 
a drug-related offense, albeit misdemeanor, now will just be referred to or reflected as a disorderly conduct. Disorderly conduct. conduct. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So um, the person that get the, the, the person that gets um, caught with less than an ounce of marijuana would be charged with disorderly conduct. That's right. Uh, if they're if they're charged and prosecuted in the county ordinance, now law enforcement still has the discretion of charging and prosecuting them under state law as a state offense, a state misdemeanor. Yes, sir. But I mean. If his would marijuana be mentioned in the in the arrest in the citation, or just be he'd just be charged with mm. disorderly conduct. I, and, and I, I be, think that probably no, there no would be a, of marijuana. Either there there'd be a notation in the citation or in the file because mm -hmm. it's important for the court to know because a, viol a violation of disorderly conduct ordinance consisting of misdemeanor marijuana possession is limited to a fine only. The others are uh, it's typical. Um, uh, disorderly conduct, it's uh, fines of up to $500 and or uh, imprisonment of up to six months for, for more serious offenses. But that's the only reason I think it probably noted in their file is just to ensure that the, the, that the punishment is limited to a uh, monetary. Uh, but I, I guess I, I'm just, well, uh, I'm a lot confused because this, it says prohibited conduct and it mm -hmm. talk about disorderly conduct and we were just talking about um and the, the, the marijuana misdemeanor where possession is not mentioned in here but it would fall under um item uh five and that's generally you know if you're basically loitering in oh, an area not narcotics yes sir or any sort of illegal substance even alcohol um then you know Oftentimes, the grounds for that is they have found something in your possession that would indicate that's your intent, such as drug paraphernalia or even actual the drug itself or alcohol. So a, a guy walking down the street and he looks suspicious and the police uh, say, hey, come here, you look suspicious, and they search him. And um, they find a joint in his pocket, then he'd be charged with disorderly conduct, even though. I mean, I don't think the search. Though, I don't think the search would be legal, but mm, this, right. I mean, but I, I don't think they care about the search being legal. Yeah, <laughs> I hope they do. <laughs> well, I, I hope they do too. But, but um, well, that, that's that's another. There are all. I, we don't have to get into it tonight, but there are all kinds of public policy arguments in favor and against these sorts of ordinances. But one of which are the kind of pretextual stops that you mentioned. You know, if a, a young offender or any offender is found with possession of uh, less than one ounce of marijuana, they cannot be detained or arrested. They cannot. So, I mean, if you charge them under this county ordinance, and it's uh, again within the officer's discretion, but he can do that and let, just cite them and let them return to their home. Now, if arguably, if you're if you're arrested uh, for a state law offense, you could be arrested. You know, uh, and. Uh, processed at the station and you'd have to bail out and you know traditional uh, procedures for criminal offenses yeah. mm -hmm. but but, I but would, again i think the discretion in large measure will be dictated uh by the sheriff i'm sure you know he'll have recommendations for his officers how to uh you would. how to uh, handle misdemeanor marijuana cases and i'm sure officers will still have some discretion you may have some very unruly uh, offenders and uh, you know they again they had the discretion of charging them under the county ordinance or state law well you know it, it yeah. just it just appeared that you know we um, we don't want them to get in trouble for smoking weed but we don't even want to mention smoking weed we we, we call yeah, it on, we, on their we, on their we, official we, record we, we, we call it that something be. else yeah on their official on their official record it would not be so you, so you don't blemish the commission yeah, Commissioner, get, uh, Commissioner Stevens trying to get in. Okay. I would say this is an issue that does need to, there's some great concerns about it. I have not received no phone calls about it, but it's a great concern. Uh, and I think if we go back and revamp some of these issues on here and get some more input from uh, officials from other counties and from law officials, I think it would be a good thing to, for this county to pursue. Since Hines will always already have it, it works. I think it'll work for Liberty County. Uh, we'll bring it back. Yeah. Um, a, 
Again, Mr. Chairman, I, I mean, I, I don't have a problem uh, adopting the misdemeanor marijuana war marijuana ordinance, but let's <laughs> let's call it that mm -hmm. if that's what we're doing. But we calling it something else and sneaking marijuana in there like we like we're ashamed of it or something. Right. Well, I won't go into the legalities. I can discuss that later. But there's there's a legitimate legal reason why we're approaching it this way. Uh, you know, some right. of the jurisdictions have approached it in other ways. But anything we enact, we want to be legally enforceable. Uh, but uh, again, given the practices of the court, that may not be quite as important. But uh, again, any, anything I recommend to the, this body, I, I want to be legally enforceable. Well, I, I just know that, you know, we, we kept mentioning Hinesville and what they did. And, and when I, I was over there when they did it, and they call it marijuana. Yes. And we call it disorderly conduct. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, I, I think it's, it's basically the same ordinance verbatim, correct? For the most not, not, never, well, is it you know, just a little bit? jurisdictions, especially municipalities, have right. taken the approach. It's a very simple ordinance. They simply say, you know, anyone charged with, uh, found with, you know, uh, one or less than one ounce of marijuana is subject to a citation only offense punishable mm -hmm. by uh, a civil fine not to exceed X amount or a graduated fine as we discussed. Right. But, and I'll, I'll be happy to discuss with you. No, no, outside that, that's the meeting. okay. I've, I've, there's a legal I'll, reason that uh, we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. we, we always, we, we can if, if that's what the No, no, like. no, I, I don't have a problem. No, that's, your, that's your job, sir. I, right. I think that's why people call me Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but, but I, I'll, I'll just say in a nutshell, cities and counties, if, if state law addresses a criminal offense, it's essentially deemed to be preempted unless there's a specific state statute which allows counties and municipalities to enact laws that are uh, similar to those um, provided by state law. Right. Okay. So that kind of falls on what the home rule. Yes, right. I, I mean, Absolutely. Uh, there's a complex relationship between state and local governments. Right, right. Uh, that's one of them. I mean, if right. the state has provided a criminal offense for something, it's really deemed to be exclusively governed by state law and preempted to the extent that local and governments can't adopt similar criminal offenses. Right, and then, then also it, it goes back to uh, whenever you look at an application, whenever you ask that that question, have you ever been arrested? Technically, they haven't been arrested because it's only been been dealt with from a citation. A citation. Only, that's right. Right. Yes. Yeah. So if if they're charged that. under this county, under this they county would not order. be detained or right, uh, right. arrested. They would simply be cited. That's right. There we go. Mr. Chairman, one other thing before we go to you. Kelly, would you read that second paragraph starting with whereas? Yeah. Whereas by this yes, uh, desire to further protect the health, welfare, and safety of the citizenship and residents of Liberty County, Georgia. So by passing this and having a marijuana ordinance, we're protecting the safety, welfare, and health of Liberty County. Yeah, I, I could be more specific if you want, but yeah, it's just standard language supporting any ordinance. No, 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 sir, you're reading it right. But this is just for information. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'll get with you. Thank you, sir. Oh, yeah. Give me the update on I heard Commissioner Gibbard call it weed. That's what it is, man. That's right. what it is. And I will say this uh, from what I've heard, uh, and I will talk to uh, uh, Mayor Van Johnson. They have proven that the stats the usage has not gone up once they passed this resolution. It, 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 right. it has not been more. Um, I know. I, I, I'm pretty sure I heard that from the city of Savannah, but I'll check with him. And I'll, I'll get I'll get the board additional information on them regarding the public. It doesn't encourage and other jurisdictions smoking, as well, yeah. if you'd like. Yeah. Smoking at home, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Thank you, sir. Are, are you presenting on the judicial tax book? Uh, I'm not. We can't. I can. Uh, with if, he, I uh, think he, he's yielding to you. If thanks, I'm, Commissioner. Sure. Yeah. I, I think also before you have another ordinance, which authorizes uh, judicial foreclosures. Uh, uh, to uh, better enforce uh, tax deficiencies. And, you know, currently, uh, and state, I, should state, should, I should say state law does not allow tax commissioners to take advantage of judicial foreclosure proceedings unless the Board of Commissioners specifically authorize it. And I, I think most of you know under Georgia, foreclosures are typically non-judicial in that you simply give the uh, you know, the debtor notice and you abide by certain court procedures, but the court really isn't involved, and that can be, uh, I guess, a disadvantage 
uh, to some creditors, especially the tax commissioner. When you have complex cases, um, you, know, you have uh, a, a person who's failed to pay their taxes and is, and is repeatedly through uh, schemes, you know, change the name, his name, the, 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 the title holder's name to try to avoid the payment of taxes. You might have uh, estates of deceased with very complicated heir arrangement. Uh, there are all kinds of specialty cases that kind of fall through the cracks that aren't really appropriately addressed by non-judicial foreclosures. And so having the court involved kind of in a large part removes the doubt for many of these cases and allows the tax commissioner to foreclose on property and uh, with some certainty and be in a position to, to later sell it. And the tax commissioner can speak on it if he wishes. I don't think his intention is to use this generally or abuse it or uh, uh, use it in a large number of cases, but just as needed to address those specialty cases. All right. Mr. Jones, did he do all right? He did. Yes, sir. All right. Are there any questions about the? Uh... You, you, uh, you can still sell property, though, on the courthouse steps. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Okay. And, and, I, and that's his intent. I mean, the vast, vast majority of cases will be sold through non-judicial means on the courthouse steps. But again, for those difficult cases, uh, I think judicial foreclosure is appropriate. Mr. Jones, are, are you dealing with one difficult case right now, sir? Yes. We d don't give us names and all. Just tell us about the case, if you will, so we have a better understanding of the practicality of what you're asking for. Yes, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Um, as Mr. Davis said, um, the case is one where um, it's one that's hard to collect simply because um, the property owner has found out how to continue to transfer title and. I mean, uh, the property owner has just basically avoided, you know, they, he know, they know the law enough to avoid being in compliance with what's required as far as um, property and property taxes. So this particular um, resolution will give us the ability to do the uh, judicial sale, which takes away any ability for a property owner to pull any kind of scheme or any kind of um, process where they can avoid it. Uh, mm -hmm. The judge would basically, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Davis would give us the ability to uh, give us an order to collect through a specific sale where there is no way that property owner nor uh, represented by an attorney um, can avoid, you know, paying a their fair share. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. Sir. All right. All right. Everybody got it? I want to make sure yes, um, everybody's aware, um, especially with the resolution that you all passed early in the year, we're, we're very lenient that right now. We're working with property owners. Our idea, plan is not to sell property this way. It's just to resolve, as Mr. Davis said, these very difficult, special, unique kind of cases. I make the motion that we approve the resolution. Presented. Is that a second? Second. Motion and a second. We approve the resolution presented by Mr. Davis and Mr. Jones, any further discussion? Thank you. All, all in favor, raise your right hand. You got what you need, sir. Go, yes, to, sir. go to war. Thank you very much. Go to war. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Georgia Stewardship Grant. Joy, it's cold in here, man. That <laughs> no, was cold down there. Breathe a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> feel good. Yes, sir, thank you. At, the, at your last meeting, you had presented to you by Georgia, um, I believe Georgia Water Sports, uh, that came to you and CRC attended also to consider a application for a stewardship grant as the county being a conduit for that money to come back to a proposed activity down at Sunbury on some property that's owned by Department of Natural Resources. That grant is through uh, Department of Natural Resources. There's a tight deadline for, there's two stages there. There's a pre-application that's required that's pretty extensive. Uh, that deadline for that application is about in the middle of October. So we would need to really get rocking on that. We've had some, uh, a couple of conference calls on it to see what would be required, be, be pretty extensive to put together. But we'd need to get through that and then get through that hoop and there'd be another year waiting period while those are analyzed. It's on a scoring process by Georgia Department of Natural Resources. And then if we're approved, we would go through a second formal application. So it'd be about two years away. Uh, just as a reminder, particulars on it, is that it does require a 25% match. There would need to be a memorandum of agreement uh, at the time of formal application 
taken uh, with that association where they would agree to uh, fund the 25% match requirement, at least 25% match requirement. In fact, uh, under the point system we looked at the other day, really you have to fund more than 25% in order to really even be competitive. But we'd need to have a memorandum uh, of agreement on that. I think all we were to come back tonight was ask is if you wanted us to even move forward uh, with that first application process. Uh, the details and everything, you know, at time of second submission, we would have those agreements in place and they would have to agree before you took the next formal step. Uh, just as a reminder, the county would have to basically, uh, the grant su submittee would have to fund the project fully and then upon project closeout would get reimbursed uh, by Georgia DNR less than 25% or, or more requirement. Okay. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> yes, sir. I heard you say that this organization will fund for 25 percent but then you come back and say Liberty County will have to put the money up front yes, sir. what guarantee that we have that we will get the return what we'd have to do uh, Commissioner Stevens is before we ever took that second step in the process if you desire to go forward is is to have an, a memorandum of understanding with them or a contract with them that said that the county is going to do this and where they legally then obligate uh, their money. And we would know the amount then to be determined where it would be 25%, 35%, or 40% that they were gonna be required to pay back. Now that 25% or 40% is of what, 5,000 or the 3 million? Uh, it, would, it would be dependent on- 500,000. It would be, yes, it, it would be dependent on the total project cost. So what, what, it'd be 35% of the total request in the grant. So if the grant was $100,000 and, you know, their share would be 25% of that. Mr. Chairman, and, and what Commissioner Stevens is talking about is, of course, he and Commissioner Bowen, they have that area there. They're talking about the Sunbury, Sunbury ramp, right? Mm-hmm. But the um, only thing that I want to say about it is I hope that we are more involved in the design plan and some of the things going on. I, I read in the newspaper because I missed the meeting and I saw the article where they said that, you know, it is a fishing community. Right. For two years, I mean, there's a lot of people that live down there and a lot of people that use it. I, I don't own a boat, but I go fishing and, I, and that's where I go. But the you know, you've got homeowners there and there's going to be a lot of traffic and whatever this sailing venture is going to be is going to be geared toward what they need and you're going to have a parking issue uh, yeah. because mm -hmm. I've seen you know as many as 30 sailboats and there are people that ride together but with COVID they're all going to be in separate vehicles so <coughs> I just want us to let's Let's make sure that we, uh, two years is enough time that, to create a lot of concern from those people down there to say, you know, we didn't hear nothing about it. I know the article has been in the newspaper, but let's, uh, let's make sure that it's out there and it's, it's a time we can get a little bit of community input from some of them yeah. down there. Um, Yes, sir. I, and, and all those great points, and I, I think some of those were excerpt concerns were, were expressed. Mm -hmm. They were expressed. Um, <clears throat> you know, the other option is to, it is a very tight time window uh, to be able to put that stuff together. The other option is to go ahead and possibly have them fund that design, which they could count, possibly count. No, that's not right. Money, money spent out ahead of time on this particular grant could not be counted as a match. Uh, that, that question was asked the other day. But if you, if you want them to go ahead and fund some design, you, I guess my thing is, or, or go ahead and gather community input before you decide to even apply. I mean, I, I would, I would kind of hate to see us be in a position where we spend the time we're gonna spend, which we can spend, to go forward and submit a grant application and then really not go to the second round. I don't know if that sends such a good signal. You know, I had the opportunity the other day to be down there, and, and while I ran some people that I know, I just kind of ran it by them. Most of them are used to the sailboats already. They're, they're used to the sailboats being there already. Oh, yeah, they've been using mm -hmm. them for some time. Yeah. But, I mean, and, and there was no negative feedback from those people. Yeah. They, they just considered them I mean, to be... You're, you're 
you're going to hear a few people. Partners. But it's down at the end of the lane. It's Man. not like they're right. parking back up there. But yeah. when you do have that influx, I think you may have some folks migrate on up. So we're going to need to be looking at, yeah. you know, whatever funding that is. In fact, it would be a great idea that it's going to be a state grant that the state can't do something with that road that goes from, you know, Brigantine Dunmore down there to it. The other thing about it is, is if we're going to match it, then let's try to see if we can. No, we're not matching. Other money. We're not matching. Right. We got yeah. to put some of the money in up front. Yes, sir. Well, you have to fund 100% of the project. <laughs> and they pay us back. And then they pay the match. We re reimburse. Then, so we're 100% reimbursed. In the right. Year. Yes, sir. Right. Well, it's cash flow. It's cash then, flow. Then, then in saying all of that, then we ought to be able to at least work with them, and they work with us on on some, uh, at least a, add on to the pier and maybe some some fishing reefs that's out there close enough that people can use it. So, uh, I mean, I, I know that they're important, but, you know, you, you talk about when they leave Savannah, they got to cross the Geechee River, and then they got to come all the way through Bryan County. There's a lot of places you can put a boat in that. That's right. But, the Geechee River is there. So, I just, you know, I, I, I don't know. It just all of a sudden showed up, and everybody's just kind of, you know, well, okay, they're here. But it does belong to, you know, it's a the ramp right there, I guess part of it's ours and part of it's DOT. I mean, um, DNR. DNR. Yes, I, mm -hmm. I think it, um, it it belongs to them and they lease it to us. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and so they went ahead and acquired that second piece. Right. But it's whatever desired board is. I mean, certainly right. we're just we're just bringing it back as well, staff. Just, to, yeah. yeah. Well, I want to work with them myself. I, I see it as not it. Yeah, I don't say I don't think we ought to just shut them down. I'm just no. saying, let's make sure that when we're sitting yeah, in the table looking at them. Now. Yeah. And all and all those issues are addressed also. Mm -hmm. We right. did. I mean, we talked I, about all that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we need to move pretty quick. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, we we would just yeah. need a motion in a second tonight yeah. to to yeah. go ahead and make application and and, and certainly just whatever yeah. whatever the board desires. Right. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman. Uh, you said you talked to several people the other day, right? Mm -hmm. But and Mr. Brown, you said about who said about thirty boats. Oh, I was Commissioner Wall on that made that statement. Now, when they come, it will be more than 30 boats, right? Probably. Yeah, I think it indicated in their presentation time it would be more than 30 boats. I do think they had plans to do some parking on that side for those boat storage and those boat launching mm -hmm. procedures, if it I did. remember right. And I do have that presentation. <clears throat> it did. I think somewhere if we need to. That's all part of the project parking. Mm -hmm. I think the mm -hmm. boats will stay there, from what I've seen. Yes, sir. That's my, under the that's my understanding. Is mm -hmm. they're going to have boat storage down there? I think that's what they showed. In fact, mm -hmm. on property we're not using yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, yes, property we don't own right now. Yeah, so it's not taking our spot. This spot's not being used. <laughs> I, I do, I do. Uh, you know, without getting on side, of it, I, I do. Obviously, I'm concerned about the traffic and right. about congestion, it's about going. homeowners, and about how those and, and and the board did express last time. You know, going to have to. Have a lane open for those salt water injuries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a. It's mm -hmm. going to be congested. I mean, it will be. Uh, I'm foreseeing the area grow, new things coming in, but we also we got to look after the infrastructure. If the infrastructure is not right, we are moving ahead of ourselves. So. Uh, you know, the other option is well, no, I don't think DNR can obviously apply for their grants, but. Um, I'm not sure what other agency. The reason they can't apply themselves is the way that their organizational charter is drawn up mm -hmm. uh, as a uh, nonprofit. Um, I, I don't know if they have the option to redraw that where they could automatically apply, but that's the only reason they, they came to CRC and CRC came to us. Mm -hmm. The CRC is going to help with the uh, application process. And <laughs> we are. Coast and everybody loves it. And we like some of their goals. <laughs> yeah, that's what I say. And we are guarantee we are guarantee our money that we put up back. This is taxpayers' dollars. Eventually. I understand, sir. And, and, and listen, I share that same concern as tight as I am, sir. Uh, I, I would tell you that all you're agreeing to tonight is put in phase one of an application. You, if you make it to round two, you are not obligated to go forward until those agreements are in place, and, and they would need to be in place. Okay. okay. All right. Mr. Chair, is, All right. I mean, uh, I, I think one of the biggest concerns, what I've heard, is is with the traffic with the boats. Mm -hmm. I mean, has that been addressed? Like, do they have a plan or 
or it's nothing that they could do? Like, I mean, ha have they presented a plan to us, or can we make them present a plan on I mean, the I, traffic? I, I think the only thing I can do is refer back to the, the co almost exact comment that was made last time, which was the same thing, was mm -hmm. which was to said that they were planning on giving priority to folks that wanted to enter, mm -hmm. put in, and take out mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. their sailboats because it took so little time to launch. Right. Now, <laughs> that, I'm just kind of... Pardon the phrase, regurgitating what they said. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, sure. I agree with Commissioner Frazier on that part, and with it being part of my my district, I would agree that we can get them to come up with some kind of plan to show us how they are going to make sure everybody is comfortable down there. Because if it's not, it's going to fall right back on this board of commissioners. So That's just, fair enough. So but, that's, that's, but right now we need to. Yeah, yeah. So I guess yeah. really the immediate thing is, as part of it, do you want us to go, go to forward. round one yeah. to develop those things? Mm -hmm. yeah. They're gonna. They would have to, to pay to develop those plans yeah. to put in the grant, mm -hmm. and then you'll get a look at those, and then you can Before either move. try to modify that mm -hmm. for the second right. round submission, mm -hmm. uh, or uh, or not go to the second round. Okay. All right. Ready, sir. I'll make a motion that we. Uh, through the first step. Through the, through the first step for this uh, sailing industry. Okay. Is that a second? Second. Is that a second we approve uh, step one? We'll get into the agreement. And then we'll work all the. If, all, if it all should move. All those details will have to be should, rolled into If the it should be year. successful. Yes, if if we get to the If it should be successful, yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, but, uh, well, actually, that'll be your motion. So I, uh, I think you have to amend that. Jim, so I'd like sure to amend that, that, that motion. Yeah. yeah. To a minute with the uh, them showing a uh, a traffic a plan. traffic plan okay. how it will be handled down in that area. All right, I second that. Okay, all right, <clears throat> thank you. All in favor? <clears throat> all right, we will step one. Thank you, sir. We got it, and uh, we're you know we've already told them on the phone the other day with CRC we're going to do our best to work together to get the application mm -hmm. together. There is no guarantee we'll meet that deadline anyway. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty pretty short run. So we're going to we'll do our best for you to Thank try you, to meet that. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. And to meet that deadline, is that upon you, too? Well, <laughs> we're, we're going to divide up as a team sport between three of us, and so we're working through that now. But I I didn't even want to start pushing forward with that unless we were going to go. We've we done the preliminary look, so we'll work on that. Uh, if you'll bear with me, yes, I got sir. several things I need to catch up on tonight. I see, I see uh, you, Clint. Please. I see you on the screen. I want to give you a quick update on all the projects we got going on because because October is a busy month, and so the Lake George Fire Station renovations, uh, that bid date <coughs> due to get those back in, that provides some enhanced sleeping quarters at the Lake George Station, which is our temporary main I say main station, but it's where our third third crew will sleep, and we're bringing those on now. So that's that bid opening date. Very minor. We anticipate those costs to be somewhere around thirty thousand dollars. That is in your approved budget for this year. Islands Fire Station punch list, final punch list we think, Trent mentioned this, will come in October and we should be able to occupy that station in November. Don't see anything to stop that right now, uh, short of something that is really, 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 really unexpected and I won't even mention that name. Uh, Midcoast Tea Hangers, we talked about that. We have a hangar waiting list at the Midcoast <coughs> Airport. Uh, we went to the state of Georgia and asked if there was any money available to expand those tea hangers and they said yes. So we ran up a grant request to them. Our project cost is estimated to be about $750,000. If we're successful in that grant process, and if our bids come back in good in that 750 target range, you're probably looking at about $75,000 that three partners would need to split on that project. So it, uh, it has turned out to be a pretty, good, a pretty good thing there. I would tell you that if we had to put out that $75,000, when you do an amortization of what we collect per hanger, per T hanger out there per monthly rent, if you even just did that, you would pay that back in five years. So it's a pretty good deal uh, for that. We'll keep you posted on that. They are due to open on the 19th. Public safety radios, we actually had that bid opening today. We had two, two proposers on that. This is in your budget. Uh, this is part of the fire plan to update those radios for the new people. Um, both one of those bids came back within the target range, and you you'll have that at your next meeting for consideration to do that. That was for um, 
18 radios? 18 radios. 18. 20, how many? 23. 23, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. There, there were 18 of one type, and then I think there were some other. Okay. Um, we, excavator bid date, 10-1. That, that's in the budget uh, for a new excavator for the road department. It's Head Start fun. Center, uh, <laughs> federal project, federal, largely funded federal project. So under all the federal Davis baking guidelines and federal Davis uh, baking, bacon bidding provisions, uh, is now due to open on the 8th of October. Thank you. You will actually be the ones that award that contract, but then we'll, we'll fund out the first $250,000 of that since we're using CDBG funds of that. Commissioner Stevens, that'll be paid up front, so that'll clear that CDBG out. Yeah. And then the rest of those project funds will come from a federal grant to the um, Coastal Georgia Community Action Authority. And they will then pick up that and, and we'll continue to administrate that because we have to do it for CDBG guidelines because they were involved. <clears throat> but in the end, we'll be through paying out money. So right. we'll be obligated for the 250 up front. Let me say this while you're on that. This is uh, when we get it down to what is it, 75% of it spent? I think we can go ahead, Mr. Chairman, and start looking at some additional water projects, uh, finishing out the Scriven Fork area. And you may remember that's already been designed. Right. Uh, the board's already used <laughs> sales tax money to do that design, so it would be just to make application and, and pull the trigger on that. Uh, Liberty County Freight Connector, quick update. We, get, we have uh, monthly meetings on those. That is a 2023 uh, bid let date now. We're in environmental, final environmental on that. There will be one more environmental public hearing open house on that. And we're working through those details now. The good news on that is this. <coughs> GDOT has agreed to do all the right-of-way acquisition. That was not a previous commitment by GDOT, but today they let me know that. So that is, that's huge. Good job. Yes, sir. That's good huge. Job. Now, and this, then, this 2023, sorry. you know, we always say with <coughs> GDOT, if something's let of, of, of bids uh, let in 20. 21 that actually happens in 20. So 2023 is literally 2023? It would be calendar 2023, March, actually March okay. of 2023. Oh, so if they're led in that, you know, you're, you're talking about construction. Everything goes right. You're talking about construction starting sometime in that uh, probably fall period, okay. summer and fall period. The Mid Coast Airport <laughs> layout plan, we looked at that on, the, on, on a map not too long ago. That is just continuing. That's a future plan for the airport, really for some industrial type expansion uh, out there, say industrial, that's a, bad, that's a bad word, but for commercial type aviation type use to come in. And that's something we're having to do for the Corps of Engineers uh, just on our planning process. Any questions there? Uh, some other things we're working on. We, we did get a modified grant approval from uh, GEMA, Georgia Management, uh, agency that's actually a FEMA <coughs> pass through for some old hurricane funds. We had been previously awarded that grant, but we went back to do a grant revision or a modification based on the cost of the project. Um, and that was uh, approved. So now we're, we'll be putting together a bid packet. Um, the project itself is supposed to be completed by 1231. We'll do our best to meet that deadline. I do think we can get an extension if we run into some problems. We were just, just informed of that. So pretty short window for that too. We did put in, you may remember, for a federal grant that was awarded to some coastal counties from a separate hurricane. Uh, we put in to put a new East End Tower in to help our communication, public safety communication folks. Right. We, we did get through the first pre-app round. <clears throat> but now we'll be putting together a final pre-app uh, for that radio. That money has to be awarded in this coastal region. It is competitive. But I'm happy we made it to the second round because this really affects several counties. And so I think we feel good, we feel good about going forward with it. And I'm happy we made it to the second round. Um, the website, we're changing the website completely. You may remember that. We're going to Civics Plus. So uh, Mr. Clint Stanley, in fact, is leading that project for us with IT and it, and it has mobilized us for that. You see the deadline there. The main one I just want to tell you is that uh, we'll do a concept approval on uh, October, middle of October, we probably at that time, what we'll probably want to try to do is come to the board and let you see where we are, look at the website, we'll send that out to you because then we got a very short time frame to say, is there any changes that you want to see made? 
okay? Uh, I will tell you this just in general, and I'll pass on this. You see the launch date of right before Christmas, so it is, it is a very compressed project too. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very time to find. Look for a website that doesn't look like a governmental website. Because the sites we have previewed and the sites we're modeling after and what we're going after now is a crisp, clean, easy to manipulate website. Eight years in the making. So it's going. It's going to be. It's going. I think you're going to enjoy it. And I know the public's going to enjoy it. In fact, we're running some stuff out there right now uh, to some folks, some shoppers, if you will, to say, give us some input. Um, and then the la uh, on, last thing on this list. We've talked about it for some time. I guess COVID has made us do things different. So I had someone come in the other day to take a look at what it would take to do some bench alterations, uh, Commissioner Stevens, <laughs> to be able to take that bench and make it look exactly like that side uh, to do a flare out. It would also provide some on the floor tables, much of what you see like this. It would also move Mr. Stanley to the back uh, so the sound gets operated out of there, which is really where the cameras and all need to come from. Additionally, uh, we, we met the other day with sound system about doing some alternate screening, uh, possibly putting some podium um, CRTs up here for you to look at. CRTs, excuse me. How about flat screens? I'm going way back. But mm -hmm. to put some flat screens up here for you all to look at, to put some better audience viewing out here, uh, to look at some things. M my main thing to ask you tonight the bench modification with a different top that you've got up there that has uh, been in there since 1992 is a laminate and is not in great shape. Changing that out, changing out the strips, adding the wings, adding the tables, adding the sound is about $9,800. There is about a 12 week lead time before it could even be started. So I wanted to see what your feeling was we're trying to go ahead and get some definitive drawings done. We've got to have some demo we have to do. We'd want to run some cable under the floor and do a few things while we did it. Uh, but you're looking at less than $10,000 to do that. And, and I, I would want to think, hope that we come out of the environment we're in. Um, but I think we got to be prepared to give you some more space anyway and do some things that we need to do to be more efficient. So I, I, certainly up to the board. We'll continue to perform. As you need us to perform. Well, I would say move I'm, on. I don't like speaking for Commissioner Stevens. No, you don't. But, you but, can't. but it's one time I ha I can't with this one. <laughs> I, I think he's tired of not being able to see you, <laughs> Mr. Chair, <laughs> Mr. Bowling. Uh, well, Commissioner Gillard, he, he's in my old seat right now. Right. <laughs> I, I know he, he he's one hundred and ten percent support of mm -hmm. it because he can't see nothing when I lean across so Dang. see yeah move forward sir <laughs> yeah I, I think it'll be great I, th I think it will be great for the public and for you guys as far as operational goes so we'll plan to put that on our project schedule stuff on the radar that we've got is this DNR stewardship grant now that, that we'll start on uh, we are, Trent is finalizing some things on handicap accessibility in the parks for sidewalks. How, how, how far are we to completion of that? I, yeah, We've been I, working on that for a while. Yeah, I really need to reach out to him. I'm yeah. a little surprised it wasn't in his report tonight because yeah. what, all he was really going to do was go separate out, separate out a big drainage part of that mm. and just try to focus on sidewalks. But I would think that would come to you. I can, we can have that to you okay. by the first meeting. All right. So. And then, um, Fire station design at Miller Park, of course, nothing has really started shaking there except a lot of surveying that's gone on with the property that you acquired and trying to do a master plan layout. Certainly that would come before the board as a draft form for you to look at. I think your indication is you want to start some design on that master fire station probably next year or sometime, <clears throat> excuse me, in anticipation of the next splice that may come up. Likewise, with road department improvements, we've met with uh, Mr. Rusty McCall who was engaged earlier on that project. And uh, we plan on going to look at a couple of facilities in Statesboro as soon as we can free up to go uh, in Statesboro and Effingham that have been recently done, come back with some options for y'all. So we are moving on that. Mr. Brown, uh, didn't we say one time we was gonna look at designing the whole area, the recreation and the Miller Park, the fire station combination? Yes, sir. So we won't have to go back and do another. 
Yes, design. yes, sir, absolutely. That that's the master plan. Be the master plan for that whole site. It will include some expansion to convenience center. Mm -hmm. I'll touch on that real quick. We did have a conversation with John Culbertson just updating your fee schedule mm -hmm. for that. You had asked that we also include our commissioner thrift had uh, to relook at some of the convenience center locations. Mm -hmm. so we are doing that, and so his report will include mm -hmm. the fee schedule look plus future costs involved with expanding those convenience centers to have more traffic. And I believe well, that also came from the Isle of Wight right, presentation right. the other right. night, too, to make sure that was <clears throat> Okay. So bear with me. <laughs> you got um, something else. Bear, bear with me. Uh, first thing I want to do is oh. <clears throat> spy that's been in the back all night. <laughs> You've been patient. Now let's mask. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, our recreation director, a recreation director, our former <laughs> land control director, his last day was Friday. Uh, this gentleman started uh, on Tuesday, and his name is Steve Marrero. Uh, Steve is retired from the service. Steve and his wife are here and have been here. This is their home. And I won't take away a lot of this stuff there. I'll let him tell you what he did. But the backside of him was dealing a lot with animals a lot with rescues and <coughs> groups and with animal control in general. Uh, he has a lot of knowledge in that and, and certainly has a great business demeanor uh, that he brings to the table and what he did in, in his job with the military. Uh, he's jumped in, he was fully immersed. Uh, he was very cognitive of situations as they exist today in Liberty County and was very on top of that. So I'm, I'm gonna back out of the way, let Steve say a few words to you or let you ask him maybe anything you want to ask him. Uh, he, he's in the process of doing a lot of review right now so that he can come back and, and, and try to make some recommendations. And we're, and we're gonna look to the future here in just a second. <coughs> Good evening, uh, gentlemen. Step Good, evening. Yeah. <laughs> right. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, like uh, Mr. Brown said, Steve Marrero, um, been dealing with animals, my wife and I, she has over 20 years of experience uh, dealing with multiple facilities dealing in the veterinary field. I have probably about close to about 11 to 12 years dealing with uh, in the veterinary field. Um, she's currently the animal uh, medical director in Brunswick at the Humane Society. Um, so she's been running that for the last almost about five years. Prior to that, she, uh, her and Dr. Ahrens took over uh, Liberty uh, Animal Clinic here in Hinesville when it was uh, originally bought by Dr. Ahrens uh, some years ago. Um, it's one of our big passions. I spent about spent 24 years in the military, HR field. Um, and like I told Mr. Brown, um, I have my philosophy is PBA, you know, people, business, animals. Um, I'm people minded, meaning that I, that's my focus. I want to make an impact on people um, and I want to keep their, whatever their, their vision is um, and just keep them in mind um, and listen to what they need. Um, business, I'm very business oriented. As far as uh, I believe any, every organization, my philosophy is every organization that involves people gets ran like a business. Um, um, and that's just my philosophy. Um, and has, has to have a business model when you're dealing with people, money, um, so forth, so on. And then animals. So this position here was a blessing because it incorporated, I, I believe, every aspect of my passion. Um, which is the PBA, um, people, business, and animals. Um, like Mr. Brown said, I know what I went into uh, when I went into it, um, and there was no there was no confusion of what I was going into. Um, I'm honored to be be serving the people of, of Liberty uh, of Liberty County, um, and honored that I was given the opportunity to be the the director of Liberty Animal Control. So that means my phone can, my cell phone can quit ringing now. <laughs> Boy, we gonna we gonna move forward, sir. We are we are. Uh, I believe we are, and we all have the same goal in mind, mm -hmm. and it's to to safety of our citizens of this county, um, and also the safety of the animals and the care of the animals. And we I think we can all cohabitate together with all the citizens here, and to accomplish the same goal that we have in the safe <coughs> action that we have. <coughs> Welcome aboard. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Likewise. Thank you. 
Thank you. He, he's going to hang around here just a second. Um, and I'm, I, I'm going to get into some detailed stuff. Sure. Uh, Mr. Rero mentioned, and, and, and this is just a highlight of where we are, our agency was founded years ago based on these principles. <coughs> these are the daily operations that the officers have to do before they do anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, by, by your code, by state code, and just to everything that happens every day. So I, I think I need to make it, and you, you know this, what, what we are operating is an animal control facility and not an animal control shelter. And, and Dr. Peters, who is our medical advisor, would make a huge distinction with that to tell you they are not the same. You're going to see where we're trying to blend that. <coughs> but this is the primary public safety mission that ties us up a, a pretty good bit. Staffing-wise, Mr. Marrero has got himself, and he's got three officers, a part-time administrative assistant, and two part-time kennel cleaners, okay? Here's a late history. I won't go all back through it, except to say, as you'll see, we've changed an awful lot. Uh, we used to be at the health department as it was started by a guy named Bill Corbett years ago, and Dr. David Beatty, who's now retired, who started that up. In the 90s, we moved to a facility on Airport Road, which is where Liberty <coughs> Maine is now, and that's when we first started our work with rescue, and there was only a few. You constructed the new facility in 2016 to really, as you'll see, try to aid and think about helping get those animals moved out. The very last thing that anybody wants to do is to have to put an animal asleep. Mm -hmm. In saying that, I will tell you this, we rely on the medical director who helps us make some determinations on temperament for animals. And, and and in, well, just to quote them, there is no way that you could ever say that every animal is adoptable or that what? you can, is adoptable or that you could ever say that you'll, you'll never, ever have to put one to sleep for medical reasons or other things. This is a list of the before 2020, and it was really probably before 2019. And, and, <coughs> I, I will send you a copy of this. We're going to run this presentation up. By the way, I'll say this for the Facebook attendees. We're going to run this whole presentation up uh, on the Facebook site. The forms that you're going to see tonight are going to be available for public and everybody, uh, everybody that wants to look at them. But before 2020, uh, we only had one agency that was pulling. We used an old gas chamber. Euthanasia was three or four times a week. We did no temperament testing. We'll come back to that in a minute. <coughs> Uh, minimal medication for the animals. We basically brought them in. We were holding them for a period of time. If somebody wanted to come pick them up, that was fine. We fed them. We kept the pens clean. And if there wasn't an adoption, we put them to sleep. Okay? I mean, it, we didn't transport. Uh, we worked Monday through Friday only. Uh, the facility wasn't open. And anybody that wanted to pick up those animals, not the public, but any society had to come get them. Okay? We went into the new facility. We went and looked at Chatham. We visited several where they use rescues. And for that reason, when you go in hours to the left, you'll notice a room that we set up with computers, just like Chatham had for those agencies that we had contracts with to be able to come to work. They could bring people there. They could look at the animals. We created some outside isolation areas uh, where they could take these animals out. They could play with them. They could see them interact. These agencies had said, yeah, that's great. That's what we want to do. And, and we made special accommodations for them <clears throat> to be able to do that. We fast forward <laughs> to 2020. And so times change. People change. Agencies change. This is kind of, this is what we're doing now. We weren't in a position facility-wise or personnel-wise because of those first functions y'all saw to be able to say, we're just going to open up and do adoptions out of here. Now, now, that's something we're going to explore, and you'll see that at the end. So, so, so we took it upon ourselves to say, what can we do, given that, though, to make it as easy as possible to prep these animals, give those rescues what they want to be able to adopt them? So these are some things we did. We've got multiple agencies involved. We've got at least four right now uh, that are involved with us by contract. The euthanasia form was changed to injection. 
with the oversight of the medical advisor. Now we have a facility where we pull them out, we pull them out, <laughs> and temperament test them. So here's what happens. Animal comes in, by law, is photographed, a report's made, officer runs a report up in a program they gotta run it up in. It's then that photograph is taken by the administrative assistant, it's loaded into a shelter track program that anybody can access. We went to a new software program to make it easier for everybody to look at. The animal is then tested for medical care. We bought a microscope. We started doing some deworming. We started to do fecal exams. We started to do anything we could so that if an agency reached out and said, what condition is the animal in? At our expense, we did some of those testing, okay? <clears throat> Two days later, after the trauma of the bring-in process is complete, we then pull them out. It takes three people to do it. It takes a photographer. It takes two officers. And they'll bring two animals out. We have to actually have a temperament dog. They'll bring the temperament dog out. They'll bring another dog out. We got somebody videoing. And they'll do a video temperament test with animal interactions. This is usually done, done according to SOPs that you'll see that are now written. So they're required to do it between days three and five, depending on how the animal is. They have a second photograph made where we've cleaned the animal up and washed it so that it looks good for adoption. And they get to see a temperament. We take those videos, we upload them to the shelter track program. We also do something else. And this was a suggestion from the agencies. Um, we created an Excel spreadsheet. I'm trying to tell you, man. I'm not even used to speaking to you anymore. I got it. <laughs> it didn't come over uh, on the screen to be able to blow up. But what you're going to see is an Excel spreadsheet that was created <clears throat> that once an animal is brought in, the spreadsheet is sent to every rescue that has a contract with us plus some. Okay? You see the disposition name, you see whether it's a canine or a feline, male, female breed, approximate age that's in there. Has it been temperament tested? If it is, we give it a rating, good, NA, bad. We go out there, we show the date in, we show a hold date, which I'll come back to, and then a final out date, and we keep notes. So that they've got some reading on that animal as, as it's there, okay? Talk about hold dates for just a second. Under state law, you're required to hold an animal three days if it's a non-owner identified animal, i.e. no tag, no microchip, or five days if it is owner identified to give them a long time to do that. <clears throat> we automatically extend that. And we go five days for non and seven a week for owner identified. If we get owner identified, we try to scan the microchip, we're trying to call the owner, we're running it up on the website to show pictures of animals in there through the shelter track. At the end of that time, let me back up. The minute we push these sheets out to those agencies, the very first day the animal comes in, they start to see a roster. Any time after that date, an agency can email us, call us, they don't have to come to the facility. They can put a hold on it. And we put their name on it. <clears throat> Liberty Humane, Carpathia Pauls, whoever it might be. So anytime after that animal comes in, day one, they can go in and tag it. So we run the five and we run the seven day hold period. After that, agencies that are under contract have an additional 10 days. 
So what you're really talking about from the time an animal comes in, did they have a chance to tag it, is either 15 days or 17 days, okay? And again, they are not just finding out about it when the 10-day final clock starts. They see it every day. Just push to them, okay? That's important. So we continue to do that. We also push out with this a link that's included to the email every day that shows those same videos, those same pictures. They don't even have to go to shelter track to look for it. They didn't want to have to go to shelter track, so now we include it with a spreadsheet. So it's every updated video for every animal that's on the roster. Okay. Sounds like we're doing everything we can to find these animals at home. You see the stuff that we do for medication. Mm -hmm. We also started last year offering microchipping, not mandating it because that would take an ordinance. But if Pat Bowen's dog's picked up and Pat says, yeah, you know what, I'd like to take advantage of your microchipping process, we only charge our cost. There's not a veterinarian cost involved. We can microchip them right there. Again, we've brought on a medical advisor, Dr. Peters, um, with the Coastal Veterinary Clinic, who does a great job to help us. We couldn't do without it. And we do do those behavioral assessments. Um, <clears throat> couple other things. You know, I'm trying to tell you. Gotcha. <laughs> Good. <clears throat> this is an intake sheet, an example of the intake sheet. So in addition to doing everything I described, there's one of those sheets filled out on every animal. So you can see how detailed it is. If you flip it over on the back, you can see where we do a, 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 a check on the back to make sure what condition the animal's in, they're all noted, they're, they're tracked through their extensive record they're kept, these are provided to or can be provided to those agencies. <clears throat> all right, goodness gracious. Come back to these. What I just handed out to is the contract, the current contract document that we have with those agencies that are engaged with us right now. Uh, that contract, per your request, is being sent to county attorney review. And so, you know, we'll see if it has to change any after that. This is what the contract is right now, though, because those agencies are under. A um, couple of things in that contract, and I'm going to fast forward real quick. They're one year in length. They must comply with Department of Ag requirements for their shelters. So they have to be registered. They got to provide, they've got to comply with the state requirements, which require that every dog or, or cat they take out of there has to be spayed or neutered. Okay, that's the Georgia law for them. They do provide that they must receive, must pick up that animal from us at the end of that extended holding period plus 10 days. Now, I will, I will tell you, they sometimes stay longer than that. And then the agencies have to agree, all of them, to have a program, personnel, and facilities available. Okay? That's a requirement in the contract. That's what they agreed to do. We didn't, our SOPs, <laughs> yeah, same thing. Oh. Mm -hmm. Good. Our SOPs, what you've got there are the original SOPs that were done in 2017 by Mr. Sprinkle. Okay. And then after meeting with some rescue groups, some things that, these things, in fact, that we looked at that were not in an SOP anywhere, 
that they wanted put in an SOP as a hard document so the officers would be guaranteed to have to do it. So what we undertook in August was a rewriting of the SOPs. Uh, and those are in the 2020 copy that you'll see and been finalized. In fact, Ms. Patty Leon was interviewed with us the other day. I gave her a copy of that. These will definitely be run up on the website so everybody can see these, the old and the new, um, because we've had a lot of requests for those. And so we've done that. By comparison, what we've heard is the implementation of the 10-day holding period under the new SOPs is the bad thing. Actually, what happened is we extended the holding period, okay? The 10 days stayed, but what consideration wasn't given was the extended holding period. And so actually, what happened in the old SOPs, you got, we had a five to 10 day max holding period. That would have been on your sheet, the final outdate. That's what the 2017 said. Now we're moving, if you do the calculation, to a 15 to 17 day out. Okay, not a 10 day, not let's take the blinder off on day one and all of a sudden you only got 10 days to adopt the animal. You actually see it on a roster. And if you do the calculation, you got 15 to 17. I'll say this about that too. They asked to do this and we said yes. The state mandate, if you remember, is three and five days, right? Three for non, five for unidentified. They said, what if they're on the list and we find somebody that wants it and it's outside the three days as a non-owner identified, but it hadn't gotten to the final holding date? Can we come get it early? Absolutely. Will you bring it to us? We'll transport it for you. If you want an animal and it's outside the state mandate and you have an adoption for it, we'll take our vehicles and we'll bring it to you. What if we don't have space? Animal comes up on 15, 17 days, I ain't got space. Then we had some other agencies step up and say, if you're out of space, you can bring it to us until you find a place for it. Okay? So you see the comparisons in the 2017 version. There was no extended animal interaction. There was no temperament testing required. There were no photos required. There was no medical testing. There was no software. We went and bought the software tracking program. There were no extended disposition forms like you just looked at. And then you look at the 2020, it's really when we added all that and put it in writing so that Steve's folks would be required to do that. They were doing it. But this makes them and give them a, a, a policy guideline to say, you've got to do it. Because irrespective of everything else, the goal, and Steve mentioned it, is to never have to try to put an animal to sleep. And that's our goal. And that's what those officers' goal is. A lot of stuff been out there, a lot of stuff been said. When I sit with him the other day, and we hear what we heard, and I got to say this from officers. I hear what I heard and, and have read about monsters and real personal name calling and watch them cry because they don't ever want to put an animal to sleep. It hurts. It hurts for the staff. So we're doing everything we can at this point to be able to accommodate that short of saying we will not guarantee you that one cannot be put to sleep. So let's talk a second about why we're where we are. Last Thursday, email comes across about an agency who really is not contracted with us, working through one of our contract agencies. It says, I can't do it anymore because you're putting animals to sleep. Um, very good agency. Very good agency, great track record. Not only in this state, but in the state of Florida. Um, they were not happy about that. We got an animal that had come in, been on the sheet as of last Wednesday, 17 days. Nobody had put a mark on it. They had 17 days to see the animal 
<clears throat> for adoption. Now, the animal in the sheet was noted. Not friendly. Okay? We, we would try to go in there and pull the animal out to do videos. Not a possibility. All right? The, the officers did not want to try to pull the animal out. It wasn't safe. And for our liability, we need to note that. Because if we let an animal out of there and, and note it as friendly and it's not, we, we got some issues. <clears throat> so the animal was noted. The animal stayed on there 17 days. Nobody put a tag on it. Nobody put a tag on it. We deemed it not adoptable. We did a final demeanor test on it. Opinion of those officers who have a lot of years' experience, not safe to adopt. But if any agency had a different opinion and they wanted to come put a tag on that animal, any time in those 17 days, if they disagreed with our determination, all they had to do was pick it up. Or we had delivered it for them. Nobody tagged it. After the holding period was up, unfortunately the dog was euthanized. Nobody tagged it. We hated it. But we can't hold them forever. Dr. Peters would tell you, and I'm hoping she's going to do an interview here with Costa Courier, when we ask her about stuff like that. And she said, let me tell you something. You put, you put an animal in a cage, you keep it for two weeks or more, it's not good for that animal. And animals generally, generally, and I want to say generally because there's so many experts out there, generally, an animal like that, generally, is not just going to turn around overnight. Okay, you go in one day, take a picture, he tries to bite you, go in the next day and he's very friendly, and he's always friendly from then on. Generally, the longer that animal stays in that pen, it's not good. We had to go back to some defined times because we had agencies that we were holding animals with their mark on them for over a month. Did we have pen space? We had some, but we were holding them over a month. Here's a problem with pen space, and we've talked about it. Because of all the things we have to do, <clears throat> as far as public safety goes, we've got to ensure we've got extra pen space. We can't wait till the hotel fills up to say, what are we going to do? You can't just take them to the hotel down the street. There, there's, <clears throat> you can't do that. We leave here one afternoon, we've got four pens open. The next day we've got zero, because we had four canines picked up at night for police calls. Mm -hmm. that, we just can't do that. And there's been suggestions about co-mingling them, and I won't get into the whole detail of that, except that if I've got Pat Bowen's beagle that he's let run wild during a hunting trip in one pen, I can't put a non-owner identified dog in there with it because when Pat comes to pick it up and its ears are gone, I just got, we got to be careful. And that's a little extreme, but we've got to be careful to do that. So in the end, I'll tell you, just to summarize it all, um, we're going to try to run up um, some things on the web to, in a very few paragraphs, explain what I just said. It's going to be difficult. Uh, we're going to do some Facebook Live stuff. But I will tell you this. We are going to continue to try to work with those nonprofits. We are committed to the public safety and trying to balance just what Steve said. That is all of our mission with the shelters to do. We do want to, once we get into a settlement mode with a new director and getting these procedures running really, really smoothly, and they're doing a good job trying to, trying to finalize that, we want to go back and take some proactive looks that have been suggested to us by those agencies about reducing intake period. I mean, that's fantastic. We all have the same goal. Let's look at some ways that we might provide some grants to some citizens to do some spay and neutering. I mean, it's like, I hate to make comparisons, 
It's like what we do for the mosquito control to make sure we don't have as many mosquitoes, except in this case, we don't want to get rid of animals. We just want to make sure that we don't bring as many in and that we don't have an increasing population that's not taken care of. I mean, we're, I think we're all after that same thing. And we're going to ensure, we've got to ensure compliance with the contractual requirements that we've got. These don't turn out real good. I didn't show these. What, what type of cat is that on the right? <laughs> <laughs> mm. Guys, I have to tell you, this is, um, is that a cat or a squirrel? <laughs> <laughs> actually, um, actually what you're seeing on the left is um, a recent litter of cats that we have at the house. That's Tiger on the left. <laughs> In fact, that's Rocky Raccoon on the right. He, we feed him too. Um, Rocky's got three legs, uh, but Rocky's well fed. The one on the left is the same litter as the cat that you saw, and the one on the right is obviously the king cat. She's inside. <laughs> Under the Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, all, all these cats we took in as a family because because they needed somebody, okay? And we, we paid a lot of money for them. We've worked real hard to try to balance what we've got to do on the public safety with those agencies. And we won't stop that, no matter how much mud is slung, no matter how many inconsistencies are out there, that mission's got to be the same. We love animals. I love animals. And I'm committed to it. The unprofessionalism, I just think we got to stay away from that. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't recommend you contract anybody. with anybody that's going to do that. Um, but that's kind of where we are. <laughs> I'll leave, I leave you with that. I'm sorry. It's pretty emotional. It's, um, <laughs> it's been kind of a hard ride. And, yeah. um, and the ride's still going. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep it moving. Chairman, I, Mr. Brown, I can say that <clears throat> if we had a bad perception, I think from what I've seen and what I've heard, we are changing everything, and we should Liberty County should get we should be Liberty County proud <laughs> of what we are doing for the animals today. Thank you. Ms. Stevens, I, I, want, I want to insure you, and I want to insure um, <clears throat> perceptions. I mean, it's just so important. Um, I know what the Bible says, but it's important. And um, whatever documents we've got, you know, we had such a mass request from all over the country. I got one from the United Kingdom today um, for a request from stuff. Trying to work all those individual emails is impossible. <clears throat> we don't have the staff. We can't do that. Um, so I wanted to come to some kind of format, though, that I could provide the public with every document we got. Um, you know, c can we can we let one faction dictate the total overall? I don't think so. I think you've got to balance that. Mm -hmm. uh, our mission, though, is to is to win the game because we're all we're all in it together, and we're all committed to that. And I deeply love those people. Um, what I would ask those folks that are so concerned is help us and help those shelters. Adopt these animals. That one animal we're talking about might not have been adoptable. I mean, I can tell you from the demeanor and being there and looking at it and trying to touch it, wasn't a good situation. But we want folks to step up, help those agencies. They need funding. They need funding. They need kennels. They need assistance to transport animals. And that's, that's kind of what I'd leave you with, Mr. Chairman, in that. And, and I really appreciate the opportunity to do that. Um, um, I, I just want, I, I want, I want everybody to, to have exactly where we are to do that. Uh, one last thing, uh, real quickly, if you'll allow me, is run a little late this afternoon. I was asked to come over to a judicial committee uh, that's been in panel to try to get jury trials uh, going again. So Chief Judge Russell 
uh, convened a meeting for the whole circuit this afternoon. Uh, a couple of takeaways of that, they've got until the mid of October to be able to come up with a plan for the circuit. It's gonna be dependent on each jurisdiction and their ability to have trials. Um, I will tell you though that you know, it's, it's gonna look different, obviously. There's gonna be some expenditures that are gonna need to be made um, on the court side here for more plexiglass, more barriers. Uh, I, will, I will commend the taxpayers and the commissioners on this to sit in that meeting and hear the chief judge say, Liberty and Tattnall, because of the situations that y'all have made available through courthouse facilities, are in a better place than some of the others. Some of the others are gonna have to look at alternate rentals of buildings, which gets into leases by the commission because technically, in order to have a jury assembled there, grand jury, the commission has to have an ownership interest. Now, that's tough when you talk about social distancing close to where mm -hmm. operations are going on. So, so I, think, I think that's the good thing. Um, I will keep you involved on that, because, and especially Mr. Stanley, because I'm sure there'll be some technology needs that come out of that. But I wanted you to know that panel had, been, had met this afternoon, and it'll be a quick process that's got to be put together by October. The, the, the hope is, the hope is that because we do have some facility availability that we will be starting to try to pull grand juries together sometime in November, okay? There are 700 cases in the circuit that are backlogged waiting on grand juries. That's in the whole circuit. So, you know, when that, when that dam opens, it's gonna, it's gonna run fast. <laughs> have that, sir, and I thank you. Yeah. Okay. I mean, those cases in Leary County, any idea? He didn't give me that breakdown, no, sir. Yeah. Not in that meeting today, but I certainly can get it. Very yeah. good report. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry. It's, I'm, I'm sorry it's so long. We have a we have a lot going on. It's no fault going on. I know we don't. Nobody wants to put a, uh, an animal down. And I'm sure your you and your staff is doing everything they can to find a home for these animals. I agree with it is it is. You just can't, you know, it just doesn't work that way all the time. And we're doing all we can, you and your staff. We, we, we won't quit. To, to find a suitable home for these animals, sometimes it just doesn't work out. We're working with that, and Mr. Morero has some good ideas that, that he's working on, too, that he can bring back and even strengthen those bonds and help those things, help those things out. I was just going to say it's a sad time that, um, I mean, I know Joey personally went through it, and each one of us has just got, a, I don't know how many emails from as far away as Mexico, and uh, it's it's a group that, just like you said, there's, there's a right way and there's a wrong way, and it looks to me like you have went above and beyond to help them. I think the folks out there at the um, Animal Control Lab, They've done an excellent job. I, I, you know, I'm embarrassed that we, our animal control officer, he left. And I mean, I, I understand that nobody showed up. And I mean, I'm, um, you know, I'm sorry to say that, I mean, I, that's, that's what just, nobody never showed up at the, at the when he retired. And, uh, <laughs> You know, I don't know. I, I just wonder how he felt, but you know, I'll, I'll go explain to him later. But it, it is. I know you've been beat up, Joey, um, in emails and and on the street. And I, I got sick and tired of hearing it. And I'm sure Joe will give a story sometime tomorrow to write about it. But it, you know, I'll let the person know exactly what my feelings on it. So. Miss Commissioner, I appreciate it, but I, I want to tell you, it's not about being beat up. It's not about any of that. And y'all know me well enough to know that. Um, we're not finished. We're going to keep working on it. We're not finished. I guess that's my disappointment. We were working on it. And before we could come to what I would call a resolution, then it became personal. And then, of course, they yeah. invite the press into it. And uh, that's not the way you work together and you work out things. You know. If and I, I can only speak for myself, but I know this board. I, Kind of say that. Listen, just give us some time. Let us work through this. Work through this. Now, and usually when that happens, no one gets everything they want. Very rarely does that happen. But we're willing to work through it. Had a early meeting with Commissioner Thrift and, <clears throat> and Mr. Brown, some other folks, and we've been working 
on it. And then before we could come to a resolution, then it, it turned what I would call personal. Um, so I, I do regret that. But you're right. Uh, we're going to still work on it. We are. We're going to still work. We're committed. And I got a guy with me that's committed. So that's we're, we're, we're still going to explore options. We're still yeah. going to listen to those agencies. Yeah. Uh, they are the folks that, that are doing a very good job in helping mm -hmm. us to move those animals. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Great. Thank you. Anything else for good of the order? No. Chair and Taylor motion. No move. Second. All in favor? Aye. It says executive. Right. Oh. Do we? We, um, do we still have that? We session. Need to as a follow up to our conversation. Last okay. Time. All right. Take, All right. Okay. Chair, turn motion. Go to the executive session. So move. Second. Oh, we were going home. Somebody say second. 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 All in favor. All right. Somebody.
Chair, entertain a motion to come out of executive session, go back in the regular. Move, Mr. Chair. Second. All there a second? Who, who was that second? Just I did. Mayor Stevens, okay, thank you. Back in regular session, sir. Uh, back in regular session. Uh, yes, sir. Just just one thing, uh, I guess, to let the folks know is that we, we had a uh, positive test case here uh, today, late this afternoon. So out of an abundance of caution, CDC guidelines, our administrative office, our finance office, and our human resource office will be closed tomorrow. And if everything goes right, we expect to be open by Monday. We'll be, we are running up, have already run up post on the website about that and posted the doors and we'll post Facebook. All right. Hope oh, still called in. Well, there won't be anybody here to take the call, sir, uh, but they're welcome to come in. The calls will be trapped, and we'll gladly return them on Monday. We're expected to be back on Monday. Yeah. Okay. So move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.